Je suis de la département de mathématiques et je suis la représentante de la doyenne aujourd'hui. Alors, euh, bienvenue à cet événement important et euh, je présente maintenant les membres de la jury. Alors, en premier, nous avons Jason D. Stockwell. Euh, en deuxième, Allison Derry. Et aussi Pierre Raffo, Beatrix Besner et Paul Del Giorgio. Alors, merci à tout le monde d'être ici et euh, on commence. <rire> C'est officiellement ouvert. <rire> euh, merci, madame la représentante du doyen. Euh, bienvenue à tous et à toutes à cette finance de tête de euh, d'ailleurs euh, Portin saint euh, Je vous explique brièvement le déroulement de la soutenance. D'une part, Nicolas va vous donner une présentation de 30 à 40 minutes de, qui résume. Euh, Plusieurs années de travail euh, dans un laps de temps relativement court. Ensuite, euh, le comité procédera à une série de questions. Euh, nous allons procéder de la façon suivante. D'une part, euh, l'examinateur externe, euh, Jason Trapois, va, va poser euh, la première série de questions suivie de Man Derry, euh, de moi euh, et euh, des euh, co-directeurs Paul de Jojo et euh, de la directrice. Euh, donc, nous allons fonctionner de cette façon-là pour une, deux ou trois ronds, dépendamment de la situation. Comme vous le savez, il y en a certains d'entre vous qui sont déjà très expérimentés avec cette procédure à l'UQAM. À la fin de la période de questions, nous allons délibérer et vous pouvez rester en salle pour continuer à échanger avec le collègue durant notre période de délibération. Il reviendront après quelques minutes à annoncer le verdict de cette soutenance. Euh, deuxièmement, euh, je veux dire, on est, on est à l'étape maintenant, Nicolas, tu vas nous présenter euh, tes travaux. Donc, M. Fortin saint gelais euh, vous avez présenté une thèse intitulée « Écologie fonctionnelle, un outil pour mieux comprendre le rôle euh, du plancton dans les lacs euh, en vue de l'obtention du grade de docteur en biologie. » Les membres du jury ont évalué votre thèse. Ils l'ont accepté pour soutenance. Je vous invite donc à faire une brève présentation de vos résultats de recherche, après quoi je vous donnerai la parole au membre du jury. Donc, la parole est à vous, monsieur. Merci, euh, Merci à tous d'être ici ce matin. C'est vraiment pour moi une journée spéciale. Merci à ceux aussi qui sont connectés via la, la vidéoconférence. Puis, euh, je vais présenter en anglais pour le bien de mon comité, mais mes, mes slides sont en français. Si vous avez des questions après ou en français, évidemment, ça me fera plaisir de répondre euh, pour ça. So, I will switch to English now. And, uh, As, so the title of my thesis was, and my goal with my thesis was really to better understand the role of plankton in lakes. And to do so, we use the tool of functional ecology to really better understand uh, this role. And just starting by, by talking about this role, we know that plankton in lakes are, are really important. And one really important function of plankton is the transfer of energy and matter and the, from the bottom of the food web to uh, to the top. So this is a quite important function. And today I'm going to focus mainly on, on that component of, of the planktonic uh, component of the food web, so on zooplankton and phytoplankton. Two organisms that were widely studied and our, our, our goal was really to better understand uh, their role in lakes. And I think it's always interesting uh, when you're studying an ecosystem to also make some comparison and, and see uh, what is going on elsewhere. And so this is a, a figure that I like a lot. So on the x-axis, you have the percentage of prime production that is removed by herbivores in different types of ecosystems. So here, uh, so this symbol represents in, for, in, in, uh, in uh, terrestrial ecosystem, in average, 30% of biomass is removed by herbivores. Now, if you're in lakes uh, dominated by microphytes, it's 20% of biomass that is removed. Then if we had the distribution for lakes uh, dominated by phytoplankton, it's 
quite different. And we can see that in average, 80% of the biomass that is produced by phytoplankton will be consumed by uh, zooplankton. So this is just to show that this trophic relationship in lakes is quite important. And that the transfer of energy and matter through, from the energy mobilizer in lakes through zooplankton is a really important function that we need to better understand and also what is regulating that function. So when we think about community, just to start really simple, so there's, of course, when I just talked about, so there's the function of a community, so we can think about is growth, respiration, and there's also the structure of a community. So it's composition, diversity, and also the interaction are taking place within that community. So this is at the community level, and as ecologists often, we're interested in understanding what environmental factors are driving changes in the structure and in the function, and as well, how, how those functions translate at the ecosystem level uh, in term, terms of standing biomass, nutrient cycling, and respiration or other functions. So this is, I think, many of the ecological, ecological questions are uh, fit in that framework. And also because we all know that we are in a world that is rapidly changing, we also need to understand the context of what is happening to this these uh, relationships in the context of a changing environment or so with an increasing anthropogenic pressure, and also, uh, and also what is the effect of ecosystem services, so services to human. So this is the, the, the a really, I would say, really uh, general ecological framework. One question that I'm really interested in is that what you can see here is that we often make the assumption, it's, it's often about the assumption that structure and function are not uh, related, or there's no direct link between these two components of communities. But a question that I was interested in is, can, what is, is there a relationship first between structure and function? And it can be both ways. Uh, you, you need, you need a, a framework to test it, but is there, a, yeah, is there a, a relationship between the diversity of the structure of a community and the function it can perform? And so that, that, that is a big, Feel. In the past 20 years, a lot of research uh, in ecology have focused on that question, is there a relationship? And you, the, the, you, there was a strong bias towards diversity. And after 20 years of mainly, I would say, experimental work, it was concluded in 2012 by Cardinale that it is now univocal evidence that when you lose biodiversity in a community, this community will produce less biomass. And so what I did is that I, I, I uh, took data from two uh, synthesis and just look at the patterns for in terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem. So here on the y-axis, you have the proportion of studies that reported in green with a plus sign, a positive relationship between diversity and production, uh, biomass production, with the minus sign in, in, uh, in red, a negative relationship, and in gray, with, uh, in gray no, uh, no relationship, so nothing significant. And what you can see that in terrestrial ecosystem, I think that this conclusion makes sense. Like and in most studies, uh, there was a positive relationship between diversity and biomass production. But in aquatic ecosystem, in most studies, the relationship between diversity and biomass produ production was not significant. And in fact, when there was a relationship, most of the time it was negative. So it's to me just looking at it, it's obvious that or we can we can see that there's probably something different going on in the aquatic ecosystem, and that general statement probably do not apply. So this was something that. Really, so after seeing this, I really wanted to better understand. So, what is going on in the aquatic ecosystem? What is the relationship uh, between these these uh, these two components? So, going back to that framework, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, yeah, just a few things I wanted to add. So, as I mentioned earlier, many most of those studies are experimental studies, and the, there was a strong bias toward diversity, and they, they talk about all diversity, but in fact. Almost all of those studies were in species richness, only the speed, the, the number of species. But as you can see, the structure of the community is much more complex than that. There's composition, there's diversity. So it was pretty restrained, I would say, uh, the way it was uh, compared. So our goal was really to see, really to better understand for plankton the relationship between environment, structure, and function. But we wanted to ask this question in the context of a lake, so a naturally complex ecosystem with all the relationship involved. So we know that, so we know that this relationship from experiment is significant sometimes. But the question that we need to ask also is that when we take into account the environment, we know then that, that lakes are really complex. So maybe that when we take into the account the environment, it's just the environment that matters for the function. And 
community structure is not that important anymore. So this is also an important question, going into syst natural system and testing that relationship and see where with the environmental complexity, can we still see an effect of structure? And this is what we did. So this is just a picture of some lakes. And as you can see, sometimes it was not easy to access the lakes we went to. So we run it to resample all the lakes. So we have sometimes our access. We use also a float plane to really be able to really characterize a large diversity of lakes in different region and really be able to test that question in, in that context. So this is uh, the map of the lake we sample. So this is Quebec. So we sample three main regions of Quebec. So we have the Abitibi, Chicoutimi, and Shefferville region. And just to look at environmental differences, uh, this is a PCA. And you can see we have the three regions, the three different symbols. And what you can see is that on the first axis, we have the difference between the two regions that are more south. So Abitibi and Chicoutimi. And you can see that there's a productivity gradient. And on the second axis, it's more a morphometric or uh, landscape uh, axis. So you have Shkutsi, which is uh, which is a which is a lot that works, which has a lot more elevation, and a BTB, which is a really really flat region. Why, where in Shefer in Shefer, you really cover all that that gradient. So we can really see that there is a, we really cover an important gradient in the boreal region of Quebec, and we uh, yeah. So now we characterize environmental factors. Now we want to we want also to characterize the structure. And one thing that is important is, is better understand now is that species interact with their environment. So they respond to the environment, to environmental factor, and they affect their ecosystem through, the, through functional traits. And uh, based on that, so we decided, so there's many ways you can characterize the structure, but we decided to characterize the structure uh, in a functional way. So we use functional ecology. And instead of taxonomic diversity, we measure uh, functional diversity. So the diversity of function and functional types in the lakes. So we use functional richness, dispersion, and evenness. And we also look at composition, because I think it's important that, so there's diversity, but there's also who's there. Not, not only how many players are there, but who are those players? And so the question we ask, what is the effect of function when, when one functional type is more abundant than the other? And of course, uh, for all those lakes, so we uh, ID uh, zooplankton and for a subset of lake phytoplankton. So a lot of microscope was, was involved in doing so. And um, yeah, on, on that map, the points where uh, the, the green points are lakes where only phy uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton were sampled, and the orange dots are lakes where both were sampled. So we can see that we tried to have the better coverage for even the lake where only uh, phytoplankton was covered. Okay, so going back to our to our uh, to this to this figure and remember uh, the objective. So using that approach, my goal was to try to understand the role of plankton in lakes. So now, let's start with the first chapter. So first of all, so as I showed in my introduction, so we were in a landscape of a lot of variability, and our first goal was to real, better understand that relationship between environmental factor and the distribution of, of, the, of the, the, the variation, the structure of zooplankton and phytoplankton on the landscape. So we wanted to better understand the biogeography and the factor that explained the distribution of uh, plankton on the landscape. And it's known that environment, of course, will affect the distribution of organism. And we divided the environment into physical chemistry and morphometry, two groups of, or two levels of environmental factors are known to affect the distribution of zooplankton and phytoplankton. We also look at dispersal limitation as is it, it is known that, uh, for example, if a species can only disperse a few kilometers and, and others can disperse thousands of kilometers, of course, it will affect their distribution on the landscape. And one thing that we really, that we wanted to, to ask also is, and this is something that wasn't asked that was not asked before because we were really lucky to have the data to be able to compare the distribution in the same study of zooplankton and phytoplankton. So use the same data to really compare what is the relative importance of these group of variables, but also the importance of trophic interaction. Because we know that on the temporal scale, so this is what uh, and, and the clear example, uh, the classic example of the clear water phase. And on the y-axis, you have the phytoplankton biomass, so usually early in the season, and this is time. Early in the season, you have a peak in phytoplankton. And also, as I showed in my introduction, strong interaction between the two. So often, you will have a response of phytoplankton, of zooplankton, and zooplankton is going to graze that biomass, 
creating that clear water phase. And so we can see that, th so this, this interaction is not happening between any species of zooplankton phytoplankton. Often it's uh, between um, silicious algae, so diatoms and fi filter feeders. So this interaction is specific. And so we know that in time, there is some strong interaction between zooplankton phytoplankton, but it was never asked, what is the importance of those trophic interaction, but at the landscape scale? And so, so this is what we try, we try to tackle with this chapter, with the, the importance of the threes factor on the landscape. And so how can we test if interactions are important? So the approach that we use is, is that we tested, we asked the question, can we predict the distribution of zooplankton using phytoplankton and vice versa? So basically what it is, is that if I know what, uh, which uh, phytoplankton functional type I have in my lake, can I predict zooplankton and vice versa? And this, this should be true if they have similar limitation. Could be true if they have similar limitation to dispersal. If they are responding to similar environmental variable, and also if uh, if there is interaction. So first we need to control for these two, and then see if we find uh, support for the idea that trophic interaction constrained their distribution on the landscape. Uh, so here, what I'm showing, this is the result of the variation partitioning. So on the y-axis, you have the variation explained. Here, you have all the functional traits for phytoplankton on that side and zooplankton here. And each bar represents the variance the variant that were explained by a group of variables. So first, space, looking at dispersal limitation. And this is no surprise here. So at the scale we were working on, no effect of space on phytoplankton, small effect on zooplankton. Uh, this is pretty much what we expected. Now, looking at uh, water quality or water characteristics, so here, let's say that this just only consider the, the two blues that as, as, as they are, are the same. And what we can see is that, okay, there is some response of zooplankton to water quality, but really phytoplankton responds strongly to variation in water quality. Now, if we add morphometry in yellow, we can see that there is some response in phytoplankton, but really, not that much, and zooplankton clearly respond also to morphometry, and mainly to morphometry. Some respond to water quality, but mainly to morphometry. So what, you, what we can see uh, using that figure is that they're both doing their own thing, right? So are they responding to the similar environmental variable? No. Uh, phytoplankton re respond to its proximal environment, which makes sense, and zooplankton respond to the morphometry of, mainly to the morphometry of the lake. Are they, do they have a similar limitation to dispersal? No. Uh, and this is something that we expected, as I just showed. And then after controlling for environment and dispersal, what we did is now we tested for this coupling between their distribution. And what we found is there, is, there, there was no coupling. So, and this is, was something that was really, uh, I, I didn't expect it. So even if you know the composition of phytoplankton in the lake, you cannot predict what will be the zooplankton composition. So, and this is something that was never retested before. So, uh, it's really, and, and just going to the, the conclusion, so they're really, both the, the, these two communities are responding, despite strong trophic interaction, they are responding to different factors on the landscape, and those interactions are not constraining uh, their distribution. So first, so, so we work on, on battling first between environment and structure. Our second goal was to better understand the relationship between environment and biomass production at the zooplankton level. As I explained earlier, it's a really important function of zooplankton in lakes, and this is, we wanted to better understand it. Because uh, it is not, uh, the, the, the relationship between environment and biomass production at the community level for zooplankton is not, is not well understood for now. And the main reason was mainly a methodological limitation, is that the main technique that is used to measure zooplankton production is the core method and it's required to follow cohorts over an extensive period of time. So it's really time consuming. And so it's, it can really help to understand production on a temporal scale because you can follow populations. And, but if you want to understand what is driving zooplankton production on a large landscape, you cannot really apply that technique. It will be too time consuming. So the technique that we use is we use an enzyme called the chylobiase. So it's measuring the production of only uh, crustaceans or plankton. So, so they have a, an exoskeleton that is, that is in chitin, and they use this enzyme chitobiase to cut chitin. And it was shown in the lab that there's a very good relationship between how much, uh, how much uh, chitobiase is uh, 
released by zooplankton and how much bi biomass was produced. So then by measuring um, zooplankton the, or the concentration of the enzyme in the water column, we were able to estimate biomass production. Okay, now, um, yeah, so remember that for me, one thing that was really important was that, okay, we wanted to understand that relationship between environment and zooplankton production, between structure and zooplankton production, but really not looking at those relationships uh, by themselves, but really understand the whole picture. Because we know that also environment will also affect structure. So it's a complex relationship. So we really want to wanted to test for this framework. And so to test for this framework, we use structural equation modeling, which enable to use these theoretical relationship and test if they are supported by the data. So I will show, so this kind of uh, diagram, I will, I will use a lot of them. And so each solid line represents a positive relationship, dashed line is a negative relationship. And each in each white box, I will report uh, the standardized coefficient. And this is the strength of the relationship, or the relative importance of a relationship in the whole structural equation model. model. Uh, yeah. So first, we look at the relationship with biomass because, of course, if there is more, more, more biomass, you would expect the community to produce more just, just, by, just because there is more biomass. So first, we control for biomass. And now, what we're looking at, it's not uh, production by itself. Uh, directly, but it's more growth. So because now it's really community performance that we're looking at. So the first factors, uh, well, what is you expected? So based on the metabolic theory of ecology, you expect that lakes with smaller organism and warmer lakes, you expect them to be more productive. And this is exactly what we found on the landscape. So smaller mean size, higher temperature, more production. And also something that we also expected, so when chlorophyll was higher, so more phytoplankton biomass, more food uh, production was also higher. And then looking at other variables, we found another layer of driver at another level. And this, this was quite interesting for us because, so you, you, have, so you, you have a regulation that is more at, at the, the lake scale, but there's driver at another scale. So this indicates that Phytoplankton, zooplankton production is responding at variable and another scale. And you can see that these variables, so we have the person forest in the catchment, person wetland in the catchment, you also have the lake area, are quite important. So we see that there's a direct link. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that um, there's a direct relationship between person in wetland and zooplankton production. It's just we're missing probably the variable that is explaining that relationship. But it still means that there is variation at the same scale, which is, which is quite interesting. And if we, you remember uh, what I showed in the first chapter that, so we saw that morphometry is important for the structure, so the functional structure of zooplankton. And we have lake area also here that is an important driver of zooplankton production. So both, so we're seeing something consistent here. So that both the structure and the function of zooplankton are responding to similar factor or factor structure at a similar level. So we're re so we were restarting to some, see something, some pattern, something similar uh, with what we saw previously. So now uh, we have a better understanding of, of that thing also, and now we were we are able to better evaluate. Okay, so we know the effect of the environment. We take into account the effect of the environment. What is the effect of structure? And so we use the same approach, the structural equation modeling. And we know from, from the first chapter that there's, an effect, that there's a relationship between environment and zooplankton structure, and we want to evaluate that thing. So after controlling environment, what is the importance of uh, structure? And, uh, and why, and just before I wanna just cover it quickly. So, okay, so there's many studies looking at the relationship between diversity and zooplankton production, but what is the mechanism? What should we ex expect a relationship between? Why what, should the ecosystem are more diverse should be more productive? And there's two main mechanisms. The first one is complementarity. And the idea of complementarity is pretty simple. It's just, imagine that you have a pool of resources that is more diverse than if you have a community with more higher diversity of functional types to use that resource pool, then your, uh, your community will be more efficient because it will be able to use fully that pool of resources. So higher diversity means also higher productivity. The second mechanism 
is the identity attack, and it's also super simple to understand. So we know that some species for some function are more efficient than other, right? It's 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 a trade-off. But and so if you think about production, if the species that are more productive and are known to be productive are more abundant in your community, then your community should be more productive in average, right? So now it's not if, and this, the identity effect, this is why it's important not to only consider diversity, is that this is not an effect of diversity, this is an effect of composition. So who's there? So do you have a productive species or not? So we looked at the effect of diversity and composition. So first, uh, this is, so, this, so we look at the importance of all of, of the functional traits of zooplankton, and we see that there is, there was, uh, when there was more daphne filtration and chiris filtration, uh, zooplankton production was higher. So we have, we found some support for this idea that there's a composition effect, and when some functional type are present, production is higher. And we also see, oh yeah, as, as we found earlier, this relationship with the environment. So it, it's really a complex relationship uh, that we needed to understand. Now looking at the effect of diversity, so we use uh, the three the diversity indices and uh, the one that was uh, it's like not selected but that fit in our model was functional evenness. So there was actually is the same is the strongest single predictor of zooplankton production. So there was a strong relationship between functional evenness. But if you if you notice, it's a negative relationship, which means that community that were more functionally dominated uh, were more productive. And that makes sense also with the with the identity hypothesis, with the idea that when those efficient species are dominant, then this is where when you have uh, more zooplankton production. So it's really not that simple. It's not only the number of species, and I'm not showing it here, but if you would use species uh, number here, uh, th there is no relationship. It's really more complex than that, and it's how your structure change that, that, is, that enable you to better understand zooplankton production. And so if I do the same thing that I did for another factor, so this is the cumulative effect of all the environmental factor, positive and negative. If I do the same thing for a community structure, we can see that in those days, the relative importance of environment and community structure is comparable, at least for, at least, at least for a zooplankton. So we see that better understanding the structure enable also to better understand the relationship between environment and uh, production. So going back to the, the, to this figure that I showed earlier between the, the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystem. So maybe the reason why that, that could explain all those non-significant relationship was that in aquatic ecosystem, it may be not the same, the same processes. So maybe in terrestrial ecosystem, we are in a, in a situation where uh, the complementarity is important, but in aquatic, maybe other processes are different. We know that these two systems are different. So we need to be really open, and I think like, uh, there was a big uh, buzz around like, using, like, trying to explain why biodiversity should affect the functioning of the ecosystem, but I think we need to be really objective about it and really characterize more fully uh, uh, the structure of a community to be able to really see what aspects of community structure are important. And they may be not the same for different ecosystem or even different different uh, species or, or taxa. So it's it's really important not to start with an idea in mind, I think, and really start to really more explore uh, the potential of those relationships. So now we better establish, uh, I think, in lakes that relationship between structure, function, environment, and we went to all those lakes. Uh, to, to, to really look at it, and now we're switching to something quite different. And now we're going to that to work on that uh, kind of landscape. And I really like that picture because you really see how so this is a diamond mine you know, or up in Northwest Territory, and you can really see the water is flowing that way, and you can really see how the mine is connected to the landscape. And you can see that there's many, many lakes, and those lakes are, are really connected to the mine. So it's and in that, uh, in that sense, it's really interesting to uh, try to understand what is the impact of that mining activities on all those lakes downstream of the mine. And this is even more important knowing that mining activities are expected to increase in the northern Canada in the next year. So this is a diamond mine and you have many projects in northern territory to have, to have an increase in the, the, the number of diamond mines. So our goal here so we have, we have our framework, same framework, and our idea was to say, okay, we were in those type of, if we go in another situation, if we add 
in the mix an important anthropogenic pressure, what's happening to our framework? And for that part, we really look only at the relationship between environment and the, 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 the functional structure of community. And we were really lucky, so we worked with the, the Diamond, Di, uh, Dominion Diamond Corporation, and they had a really good aquatic effects monitoring program. So the mine started its activity in 98. And for the past 20 years, every year they measure, so they have samples of water quality, so they also count phytoplankton and zooplankton. So this is a really incredible data set to play with, to really understand what was the effect in time of mining activities. So if we look uh, from, from, from space, so this is the mine, so this is what we saw earlier, and this is the catchment that I worked on. So water is going that way, and here we have a really big, big lake, uh, like the Grand. So just starting to look, okay, this is a PCA. What was the main effect of mining activities on the water quality? And so there's many variables affected that, that and you can, uh, there's many variables that increase, not, a, not at too high level. I would say that really the main input to this ecosystem was uh, nitrate uh, because of uh, the explosive that they used, right? So it was a big input of this in the lakes. And you can see here, so this is the first, so Leslie is the first lake after the mine. And this is what is uh, so interesting, I think, with that data set, is that you have a, a spatial, you have spatial differences. So you have the first lake and then it's decreasing, so you have the dilution effect. And then this is the, 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 the large lake at the end, which is not really different from reference lakes. So you have this effect. But you also have a temporal effect, because all those lakes change from 98 to 2014. So, so you have this gradient, but you, have the, you also have the temporal gradient. And you can see that each year there is more and more nitrate that is added. So going, looking more uh, directly at, our, at the experimental design, so we have five lakes that are downstream of the mine, so they are in dark gray, and we compare uh, those lakes uh, before and after mining activity started. Study was only two years before the mining activity started, and they were compared to two reference lakes that are outside of the catchment uh, yeah, from those lakes. And the question, uh, we asked, so, so we wanted to know what is the impact of water quality on phytoplankton, and in this chapter also have rotifer and crustacean zooplankton on those three groups. And there are two ways by which water quality or mining activity can impact, can affect those communities. So it can be a direct effect of communities that, that have water quality, but it can also be an indirect effect. So it, it's possible that water quality affect one trophic level, and then you have a trophic response. So because you have a change at the phytoplankton level, then it will affect the other level. So there's these two mechanisms that, uh, that can play in here. So first, looking at phytoplankton. So this is the, the analysis that we use is a PRC, which I think is a really good analysis to really understand both those temporal and spatial pattern. So here on the x-axis, you have time. And on the y-axis, this is the effect. So the, 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 the gray line represents are two reference lakes. And so the distance of a point, so this is a sample in one lake from this uh, reference lake line, represent all different where the communities, here the phytoplankton communities in that lake compare to the reference lakes. So it's really looking at how different and how these differences increase in time. So it's, I think it's a really nice way of looking at how, and how the, the, the lake changes. And here we have the gradient of lakes, so Leslie moves, Nima, Slipper, and S2. And so it can, and using that, you can also see this, uh, uh, this spatial uh, pattern. And so for phytoplankton, what you can see sadly also, uh, Leslie was the first lake in the, the catchment was only sample for the first time in 2003, so you see that, that big change, so it's hard to tell. But what you can see, and I think this is even, to me this is the strongest thing, is that you have Moose and Nima, the two next lakes in the catchment. And you can see that they started really similar to reference lakes. And you can see they, re they are slowly converging toward that lake, which is the most impacted. And the community is changing to, conver to converging here. And same thing in Slipper. Slowly but surely, it's, it's going at the same thing. And what's in what is interesting is that there was no change in phytoplankton bowel mass. It's really a change of community that happened. And 
Using that analysis, you can also look at what functional traits were affected, and basically what happened is a shift towards small centric diatoms um, in the lakes downstream of the mine. But one thing that's still worth noting is that even if this many activity started in 98, the response really maybe started around 2002, so it took some time. Now if you look at, uh, at Rutherford's, so here in Rutherford's there's the, the lake S2, which is the last one, the catchment, and this lake is really different from day one. Is uh, diatom composition was really different from the composition on all other lakes. Uh, it's a bigger lake. I don't, I, we didn't investigate why it's different, but it's really different. You can see that all the other lakes are super similar to uh, the reference lake, and that it, it for the first year there's nothing, but since 2008 or 2009, there is it starts to be a response in those two first lakes. So, so maybe we start to see something. It would be interesting to really continue and see how this this is evolving. But it seems that there is a response also in those lakes, and you have a, a shift uh, to. Uh, species with, with shorter spines. So when we saw that, we said, okay, maybe. So we have a strong shift in the phytoplankton community, a strong uh, shift that is starting in the Rodifer community. So we expected also a shift in the zooplankton community just because species are changing um, uh, at other level in, uh, in, the, in, in the trophic level. And what you see here actually is that there's nothing, nothing really happened for zooplankton. There is a significant change after, but really there is no pattern in time or nothing, nothing consistent. And this, this was something also really uh, that, that we didn't expect. It. So even after almost 20 years of mining activities, or maybe more uh, 18 years, uh, nothing happened with old time. So maybe it will happen in the next few years. And I think also this thing about is this makes also sense with my, what I presented in my first chapter, remember. So we saw that in the landscape, uh, there is no, it doesn't seem that there's inter or interaction or constraining the distribution. And we see the same thing here because it's hard to see from the PRC, but the shift in phytoplankton composition was major. And you have this big shift, but even if you have this big shift, you don't have a, a strong response in phytoplankton. And I think just that by itself is, is quite interesting. And just because, and maybe it was just me, but I always thought that. Uh, okay, if you have a change at one traffic level, it will affect the other, but maybe not. Maybe, maybe we, we know that change in, 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 um, in bowel mass will affect other traffic levels, but in composition, in that situation, it didn't. Okay, so just to conclude quickly that chapter, so what we saw is that strong effect on phytoplankton, a smaller effect on, on rotifers, and because the effect of rotifers with delay could be because it's a trophic response, so it takes more time, we cannot say, and really not, not a strong effect on, uh, or no effect on, uh, on crustacean zooplankton. Okay, now to, to wrap everything up uh, together. So remember, our objective was to better understand the role of plankton in lakes, and we use a large scale approach and functional ecology to be really able to understand that relationship, but I think what is important and what we really added is in the context of environment of the environment. So going to, into uh, into a natural lake to, to test it, and what we saw is that first looking at the distribution of endo factor is that the phytoplankton and zooplankton are responding to different factors uh, on the landscape, and they're and and it's it, and they're not the, the relationship are not structuring their, structuring their distribution, but we saw that the structure in zooplankton, so that these changes in structure for zooplankton have an important impact on function. So these changes at a landscape level really impact the function, and that uh, and that those factors that influence zooplankton production are structured at different levels. So also at the at other level that we didn't expect it, and this is what happened. What's happening at the community level? And I think something that is important here. I think I mentioned it a couple of times. And you know, when, when I started, one of my main interests was to look at this relationship between diversity and, and biomass production, see what is re, re, this effect of biodiversity. And often when you look at it, and you, like, you look at it from an angle that is objective, and you go in lakes and you really let the data talk, you see that the situation is much more complex. And that 
you really need to be open, I think, and use approaches. I think our approach was a really good approach that can be used to better understand this relationship. And that a one size fit all, like this, to say that uh, what's this all like conclusion that applied to every system or every organism is is not uh, is not what should be applied. And we need to better understand this relationship between structure and function. But to do so, we need approaches that enable to really approach that, those questions. And finally, uh, we use this this framework and tested it in an anthropogenic pressure context, and we we saw that. Some 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 uh, some uh, relationship we found are supported. So we found the same kind of relationship also in this context. And I think it's interesting to use a functional approach first to understand this, but also to better understand what is going on in the case of an important pre anthropogenic pressure, and compare work that is more theoretical, I would say, to also something that is more applied or that the more applied uh, side of it, and see what are the the trade-offs. And on uh, on those thing in those pictures. Thanks uh, to all of you. Merci. On va procéder à la première ronde de questions. So, uh, que ça soit... Thank you. Um, I enjoy your talk and I enjoy reading your thesis. Thanks. I learned quite a bit about functional traits. And, yeah. um, I guess the first question, and, and it's, uh, it was a recurring question for me through your first couple chapters, was your your sampling methodology. <coughs> Where you sample a whole bunch of lakes, and necessarily there's only so much time where you go deep in one lake or you go broad in many lakes. And so uh, for many of your lakes that you study, you have one sampling event. And so I'm just wondering about the representation of how much can you infer about zooplink and production and zooplink community structure and the relationships yep. <coughs> with where two thirds, three quarters of your lakes happen once. Yeah, and I think it's a great question and and it's a trade-off that, that that we decided to to have. So of course, so we went on the landscape and for as you mentioned, for most lakes, we have only one sample. And yeah, it's, it's a limitation. So using a space for time substitution, our, so our goal was really to sample the largest environmental variability as possible to be able to, to control for that and see in different situations. But also, and I, this is something I realized after, is that also to sample communities at different time in their succession to be able to also uh, use that approach. But of course, we are on a larger scale and uh, we are missing temporal patterns for sure. But something that I think, and this is also something I discovered by doing it, and when we saw the patterns, and for example, the model in our third chapter or the second chapter, we see variables. So we have factors that are varying at both scales, right? And so we have functional evenness. This is, I think, functional evenness is a good example of this is capturing how the where you are in succession in the lake. So this is variation that is happening at a different scale than the, 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 and the landscape scale. and But it really helps to understand. So I think that there's many things in the same thing. So there's different scale of variation. But I think our approach, we really enable to go, like, do a first search and see uh, what are the patterns. And we're missing, because when we know that, when we see that chlorophyll A is important, for, for example, we know that there is temporal variation in the lake within one year of chlorophyll A. And there's also variation between between lakes, right? We know that lake in Shefferville in general, general have lower chlorophyll than lakes in, in Abitibi for sure. So there is that landscape variability that's included. There's also this temporal variability. But yeah, our goal, what we're saying, so the limitation of our approach is that, of course, we cannot say what is temporal, what is spatial. But we say that, okay, we're there, and this is what we measure. And uh, yeah, and yeah, this is what we're saying. Was there, um, was there, within your overall data set, was yeah. there any way to test that assumption? Yeah, I, I thought about that for a long time. And because, as you know, so we have a few lakes when we have three points. And I, I looked for a long time, and it's, I didn't find a way, a really like, powerful statistical way to be able to use, to, or to see our model, like our model, are supported with three points. And this is a limitation. Uh, that is important. And I was thinking about that uh, later, just afterwards, and I would say, 
if I would go back to those lakes, I think I would include lakes with a bit more temporal representation to be able to, because to me before there was, okay, you can follow a lake temporally or you can do a spy this, a times for space substitution, but, and something I realized, there's probably in between, right? When you can go spatially, but also include some temporal variation to be able, and I think this would be a super interesting question that, that I realized afterward, just to be, be able to partition both effect by including temporal, but in our case, uh, with three points in, in, I think, four or five lakes, I think it's really hard to, to see. Did you, uh, so aside from the yep. statistical testing of yep. that, um, yep. just the variability within those lakes among the three sampling times, yep. did you, did functional evenness change drastically or, or uh, you know, any so like production change drastically among yeah. those times? Yeah, and th that, that is a very good question. And we had two things to look at. It. This, this we look at in our lakes, and productivity we see there is differences between lakes. So the variability on the landscape is much larger than the variability within one lake. But functional evenness in one lake, it can change as, the changes are as important as on the whole landscape, right? And this is why I think that with that metric, we really, this is really, for one lake, it really capture where you are in succession. Are we in a peak where one functional attack is redundant? Are we in between peaks? And I think this is, why it's great with that, that metric is that so we go in the landscape, we see these important environmental factors, but this variable enables us to control, okay, in that lake where I am in succession and to better predict what it would be the, the production. So functional evenness for sure, I think to me it's temporal. So it's really ca catching something temporal. As for production, there is variability uh, on, on the landscape, but also temporary. And we had also a study with another postdoc uh, in La Croche, we follow the lake, one lake, for a year. It's a bit, it's like that it's outside of our gradient, but we applied uh, the same relationship that we found. I think someone here. Someone here. We, so we applied the same relationship uh, to see what was the importance of functional evenness because we found that, uh, okay, doesn't matter. So we look at the relationship between functional evenness as we found and production that lake, and we found the same relationship. So strong negative relationship, and we support what, what we were thinking. So. As functional evenness decreased, then it's a peak of, of production because that species is super productive at, at that at that time. I don't want to take up all the time. No, no, go please go on. <laughs> <laughs> We're here to hear. <laughs> you. Okay. Um, okay. So, so I would be, I would be like next steps. I would be really interested. What you just said about that lake where you do have some coral. Yep. It would be really interesting to um, to kind of compare how much how much of the variability you see kind of a potential within a lake, how does that affect your interpretations across the landscape? So if, if functional evenness is within a lake is as high yep. as across lakes, then how does that how does that potentially create uncertainty in your conclusions? Yeah, you're right. It, 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 there is some uncertainty, but I think you would like if we want to understand. So, if someone in a hypothetical situation want to use our model to predict uh, zoopan production in on the landscape, or use on our study when they are not able to measure it, and I think that a model without uh, this metric, then you wouldn't know where you went. So, you use variable, other variables. So, some some variables are not changing in time. So, more other variables, you have chlorophyllate that is also changing in time, but also some spatial variation. But you, if you don't know where you are in succession, I think this is something major for zooplankton because those they are so dynamic. So if you use our model, it enables this, I think this variability enables to control for, for this part. I think it's on, from a, pre, pers, a predictive perspective or understanding also, it enables to better understand what is, when in time and in space uh, production will be higher. But of course, uh, so I think adding it in the model is better because it enables to, in some way, add both of the temporal and the spatial dynamics. But of course, I think it will be super interesting to be able to better understand this temporal but dynamics. And not only in structure, but also it will be super interesting also in chlorophyllia or other variable. And what is the interplay between spatial and temporal? And uh, yeah. Okay. So, all right. Well, again, thank you very much for this very lovely thesis. I really, really enjoyed reading it, and I, I found 
to me, the most um, novel aspects were the application of functional ecology and also the scale at which the research was done, the limo paysage. So those were kind of the, the, the two axes to me that really jumped out in terms of making uh, progress in terms of scientific research in the field of community ecology. Um, so I'm going to uh, start um, kind of with some general questions um, related, well, the first question is related to, to functional ecology. And so the functional trait uh, concept uh, transcends the notion of the species. Um, it makes uh, trait-based uh, studies more generalizable than taxonomic studies um, kind of by providing a common currency to compare um, similar communities from different regions or different environments. So that to me is a huge strength. Um, I was just wondering, you know, when, when might taxonomic approaches be equally or more informative than the functional trait approach and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, where where do you stand up? Traditionally people have really taken a taxonomic approach. Yep. This is kind of this is a new concept that people are doing. Yep. So and, where, yep. is yeah. It, go, yeah, okay. So of course, and you know, I, I had the same discussion with someone a couple of days ago. I, for example, if you look at all diversity, all the diversity is uh, taxonomic or functional. And for example, if you, have, if you imagine a PCA, and all the diversity indices will be loading on the same side, right? They are all correlated, no matter how you measure diversity. And there is a correlation between uh, species richness and all the functional indices, right? And I think this makes sense. Um, and it's just that. But there, and then you have variability depending on what you want uh, you want to characterize. And I think in, in most cases, and also one could say that the way we, we measure functional diversity is pretty simple. So we have a, a few simple traits that we measure, and and we have a, yeah. But for me, the main for me the main strength of using a functional approach was in my case was really to be able to find generalizable pattern and. To me, is more not uh, really it, because it's the best way to measure diversity, but it's more that so okay, we know that in lakes, species are always changing, but maybe that if they're changing, if two species when the same thing are changing, it doesn't matter, right? And in a way, we want to find a general rule and we compare ecosystem. And I think this is something that I showed on my landscape approach is that when you use functional functional traits, you can really see patterns are. We need more pattern that makes sense, and to me, this is really the, the good point. And there's probably situation where taxonomical diversity, and you know, it depends also on our organism, right? If if you have a lot of of, uh, of differences between your species and not a lot of functional overlap, then taxonomical diversity would be also equal to functional diversity. And also, you need to with functional diversity one limitation. You need to measure the traits that are important, right? So there's also also a matter of selecting the traits. So there's many trade-offs on on both sides, and people also using phylogenetic diversity, right? So there's also that level. So for me, I think it makes functional diversity makes sense because, as I mentioned, species interact with the environment through those traits. But for me, really, the, the strength of using it is really to better understand the patterns and. At another level, what is going on? And so, um, given that we're living in the Anthropocene, the year of an Anthropocene, a lot of anthropogenic-induced extinctions. Do you think that you could use, given that you're seeing strong identity effects in the, the aquatic ecosystems, do you think that you could use a functional group identity as a, a method for predicting how extinctions of particular groups might affect ecosystem function? Yeah, of course. And I, I, I don't think with our study we can go that far, but for sure, right? And I think like understand, and I think like this is something we're seeing more and more. Like maybe it's not losing diversity is that important, but depending on who's you're losing, and you're right. If we, and then maybe that we see no effect of diversity, we may say okay, but there's no effect of on losing species or I think impact on communities. So maybe that seeing an important identity effect, of course, and we know that composition is changing a lot. I, I'm not sure, but maybe. Diversity also, but there's big change in the composition. We know, for example, zooplankton, right? That it, because of the calcium and everything, so they, they are, there is change in composition and phytoplankton also. So maybe yes, you're right that it, in that context, uh, and so we did it for zooplankton. It would be interesting to do it for other organisms and see what is the importance of that effect. Yeah, in lakes. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, but I'm just curious. Um, 
And, and so, um, could you identify particular functional traits and mm. respect that might have huge, you know, larger effects on ecosystem function than other traits? Yeah, it's, you think of, yeah, it's, 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 it's really hard. And I, mean, I mean, if you think even of the traits that you work yeah. with, and are so, the ones that you could say have more profound effects. Like, and I think it makes sense, but with, with zooplankton, we saw that the response of feeding traits right. was, and in a trophic perspective, it makes sense. So trophic traits had a super strong response, yeah. but maybe with the, for another function, we may be missing something, right? right. So, but for, for zooplankton, feeding traits, and I think it's a great grouping of it really able to group species up together at the interesting level, but for us, feeding traits were the yeah. more. I was, I was interested in your, your feeding trait um, selection. It was different ways in which they were utilizing and interacting with yep. the resources. found that very interesting. Um, now that I'm working more with uh, fatty acids, quite, quite commonly uh, people are grouping animals into feeding traits related to uh, more passive versus selective feeding. Yep. I noticed that you did not group your traits in that way, and I was interested to, under, to understand your choice of choosing those filtration strategies versus also perhaps including passive versus more uh, active selective feeding strategies. Right, right. No, you're right that we, we, we kept those traits, but we have so we have the predators, like predation trait that is really an active feeding strategy. And I, I would say it's, it's the only one, but I think all, I would say, but maybe I'm wrong, but all the really active feeders would be in that category, even the cladocerin, right? So we have like a, the other species that are really actively like feeding are in that, that category. And we have for cannabinoids, they all have the same categories, which is like more between passive and active, like stationary suspension. Yeah. So I think we have, so it's kind of constrained in those traits, but you're right that it's not directly included. But I would say that all the, the predations, predaceous species would be active feeders, but it's pretty, it's only one category in our. Yeah, but, it, but it's true, I think, where, you know, so. Predators are active feeders, but among your herbivores, you also have ones that are just passing right. things over, and then you have ones that are actually picking out good things to eat. Right. But you, in fact, the distinction is there. It's just, it is there in your data. You just didn't kind of, it wasn't encapsulated that way in the writing, but it is. Uh, there. Okay, you mean yeah. better put an emphasis on, on the difference between, because you're right, and it's there. I mean, e even the filtration traits, like they, they, there is difference, right? We have, we have the scrapers, yeah. we have the. Yeah. But you're right that maybe I can I understand your, yeah. Yeah, your point. So, okay, so I think we now kind of shift. So, as I said, another major innovation of your thesis was the spatial scale at which, which it was done. And I was wondering if you could provide a really clear definition of what the Luno Paysage is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I mentioned that the Luno Paysage, and I think the Luno Paysage is including. A lot more things that when I worked on, right? I worked on one aspect of the Lino Paysage. For me, the Lino Paysage is so you have rivers, you have wetlands, you have like, and we work only on lakes, right? So it's, it, on that sense, it was limited. Maybe it was too strong of a, but I just, and maybe the, the better word would be a landscape of lakes, but I, I really find the Lino Paysage, that, and maybe it was just a bias, but I find this, this concept so interesting because we always think of, talk about landscape, and there's always a bias, but I think this idea of, a, of another level of a landscape of, 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 of water that is connected and these connectivities. And, but yeah, to me, I mean, new paysage is wetlands, rivers, lakes, all of this. And so, um, you know, thinking about um, landscapes and looking at, um, you know, how dispersal limitation did not play really a large role at the big scale. Yeah. Um, so then, at what scale should we study lakes? That is that is a good I, that is a good question, and I think also it depends a lot on what group you are studying, right? And to me, the fact and like we saw no dispersal limitation in phytoplankton, but it doesn't mean that there is no dispersal limitation for phytoplankton. That it is at the scale we worked on, and so for phytoplankton, for sure, if you want to look at dispersal, it would be a larger scale than what we worked on. Uh, as for zooplankton, we start to see some, so maybe it is, it is a relevant scale for zooplankton. So I, I think it would be really group dependent what is the right scale to look at that question. 
or environmental vir variability. I think like we had a good gradient for, for that, but for dispersal, for sure, it would be dependent. And yeah, for phytoplankton, I'm not saying there's no dispersal yeah. mutation. For sure. And so would you consider looking at, for example, taking one of your regions yeah. and, and looking um, within watersheds versus between watersheds? Would, do you think that that might... You mean at the, the, looking so at the it's drivers? Kind of medium, it's kind of a medium yeah. step, right? It's kind of the, the middle point in the gradient, going from really, really local habitats and then your broad stuff. It's right. kind of somewhere in the middle. Yeah, so that, would like, be that, that would be interesting. At, like, at the watershed scale, I'm not sure we'll be able to do it because like, we have like points in the region. I'm not sure if we have really watershed that we're, we're, we're welcome, yeah. maybe. But at, at the regional scale, it would be interesting. And we did, like, there's not, they're not in the thesis, but we did some work looking at patterns within regions. And, there is differences between regions for sure, because they are different, and it's just that okay, we made a decision to go on the landscape and see. But if we go into region, it's another thing you can open. And if you go into watershed, I guess it'd be even different, right? Even like every watershed in the region. So same same thing as uh, Jason asked. It's a really good question, right? It's, when you select your scale, you, 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 I think you, the, the the important thing is just to be honest about, about what can be inferred from the scale you're working on. But uh, yeah, of course. And so the boreal region, which is largely understudied, um, so providing a lot of you know nice new perspectives, um, it's relatively unimpacted. Right. So what if you went into an impacted, say, an agricultural landscape? Do you think that you might? How do you think the patterns might change? Uh, I, I think it would be super different, right? And this is something that we didn't add, but it would be so interesting, uh, like to add also the the. the the product production version and also in the mining <coughs> side, right? To see, like, I think in another context, it would be so interesting. So we had the functional structures, so it was super interesting to look at the effect, but in, so we can take an agriculture or a mining impact and see those contexts, because like, of course, in those those lakes, but we see that Zoplank didn't respond, but of course, if, if the environment is completely different, the effect of function may be different, right? Uh, or, or a structure and function could be completely different, and the environment may be the thing that that you are responding to. Or it could be the other way around. Like, right, yeah. and so for example, like looking at say a highly eutrophied landscape, yeah. do you think that something like morphometry would really pop? Uh, you mean for... for uh, uh, that, 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 is a, that is a good question. And I guess our, my first thing would be no, but uh, it depends. If, if there's things in the water I see that will, can be toxic, and if there's things that are toxic to uh, to zooplankton, then you may see a big response in their composition. Like you see, like if you increase pH, I would I would say that then you see a strong response to pH, right? But uh, if you are in a landscape where with mild change, I think you would still see a response to morphometry because at first I was expecting really that okay, but because we know that on those landscape phytoplankton will change, but maybe there are not those changes will not translate at the zooplankton level. As we saw, and so I think you would see, still see the, some effect of, of morphometry, but you're right, it's a mixed true environment, probably no. But even in the mine, uh, we, I didn't present it, but the main driver of zooplankton composition was, was morphometry. Great, okay, so can I keep going? One more. One more. <laughs> 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 um, so, Jason, you talked about biogeography. Yeah. And I was wondering if you thought about historical biogeography and how yeah. that might have influenced some of the underlying patterns uh, that you observe. Of course. And how does the historical biogeography of those three different regions differ? Yep. And what do you know about that? I, I, I have to admit, I don't know about how they differ and everything, but you're right, it must have it. It must have an, an importance, and it was it was shown at least for cladocerin. This, this story is not that important, but it is known, for example, for cannabinoids that history may be super important, right? And this this would be super interesting to to look at, uh, but we I, I, have, I have no no knowledge of that. But I I, I, re, we, I really thought about that, but we didn't include it. But yeah, it would be so interesting to look at this. Because if you think of the, like, the Abitibi region being a uh, glacial refugia, for example, did you find glacial relics in the bottom of deep, deep lakes, uh, mm. ice peeling off from west to east, so coming off Shikugumo huh. later, ice coming off mountaintops later, 
right. ice coming off the Arctic lake. So depending on the elevation. And, Absolutely. Uh, so it can drive your, your, your spatial patterns for sure, right? Yeah. Right. Because if you think of colonization dynamics. But that's a square. So, and also uh, hot spots um, for diversity. I mean, there's and there, there's there's arguments over whether glacial refuge are hot spots or melting pots. Hmm. But to me, that would really affect potentially some of your spatial diversity patterns when you look at maybe a grain from which species are dispersing out oh, of is, yeah. from a west to east pattern and then from a south to north. Yeah, and, and you're right. You, I, I think in that sense, we have a really nice gradient, right? Absolutely. From west to east yeah. and also to north to east. So yeah, you're right. Yeah. And it's interesting you, you mentioned that because uh, we noticed that the and the diversity is the highest in in, in, in Abitzi, like zooplankton diversity, phytoplankton diversity was the highest in Abitzi. So maybe the, these productivity is also higher there too. Yeah, yeah. everything. Like, Abitzi is a different like, it's a different region, yeah. right? But, yeah. but it, it would be super interesting to look and see the effect of environment also in the context and like, it's just not easy to include that. Like, but it's a really interesting point. And you're right that our gradient is really nice to ask those kind of questions. Yeah. So I think I, yeah. well, I, I just want to leave you some question for a second. Okay, on va on va passer à une question maintenant. Euh, moi, je vais te les en français. Okay. Euh, écoute, d'une part, euh, moi, j'ai bien apprécié lire ta thèse de doctorat. J'ai trouvé que je ne suis pas du tout de ton domaine de recherche, mais j'ai sans jeu de mots une communauté d'esprit avec euh, les études sur les communautés, puisque je travaille sur les communautés animales surtout en milieu terrestre. Euh, mon premier point, c'est que dans le fond, tu l'as très bien fait dans ton introduction générale, dans ta mise en contexte de, de soutenance de thèse, tu nous as bien présenté euh, le cadre conceptuel de ta recherche, et, et, et un cadre conceptuel qui tourne beaucoup autour de la question des liens entre diversité et productivité. Et, euh, et tu nous as bien montré qu'il y avait des, des différences, et, et, et en fait, c'est un peu le cœur de ta thèse, il y a des différences entre les systèmes aquatiques et les systèmes terrestres. Euh, et tu l'as fait de façon euh, très, très claire. Ma question est, est maintenant reliée à... un peu en lien avec la question de, du docteur Stockwell sur la euh, stratégie d'échantillonnage, la dispersion de ton échantillonnage. Euh, l'approche que tu proposes, c'est une approche qui est à l'échelle du paysage. Donc, qui, par définition, s'inscrit un petit peu à contrario de ce qui s'est fait peut-être plus en immunologie, alors que c'est une approche où on explore davantage en profondeur ce qui se passe de façon temporelle dans les systèmes, les écosystèmes aquatiques. Du moins, la, la compréhension que j'en ai. Euh, pourquoi est-ce si important, pour tester cette hypothèse de diversité-productivité, d'avoir eu recours à une approche qui est interrégionale, comme tu l'as pris? Ben, pour moi, je pense que, bon, comme, comme c'est enseigné, il y a eu beaucoup d'études au niveau du zooplancton, ça c'est sûr, mais on parle à, à d'autres groupes, aux études expérimentales. Mm -hmm. Certaines études commencent comme dessus temporel, très peu, mais pour moi, c'était tellement important de, de vraiment voir cette hypothèse-là, puis de tester, d'aller dans vraiment un gradient environnemental, parce que je pense que pour moi, c'est une question à la base qui, qui est fondamentale, de dire, bon, on a, puis je pense que c'est toujours comme ça que ça fonctionne, t'sais. il y a des expériences, qui ont mis à la base que ce processus, que ce mécanisme-là pouvait exister, mm -hmm. mais dans un environnement contrôlé, où là on met 4, 6, 10 espèces avec un environnement qui est toujours le même. Puis pour moi, une question super intéressante, c'est ça qui m'intéressait à la base, de dire OK, mais on sait dans un écosystème actuel, puis les gens qui ont mesuré, qui ont, qui ont fait des études de produits, dont Dr. Stockwell, okay, c'est connu que ça répond à l'environnement de la productivité. C'est connu que quand tu varies l'environnement, ben, les fonctions vont changer, c'est sûr. Ça a été étudié en long et en large. Mais, et donc, quand tu. Alors, avec cette importante variation environnementale-là, ben c'est en arrière. <rire> Quand, avec cette importante variation environnementale-là, je pense que c'est tellement important de tester, mais c'est quoi d'abord, c'est quoi l'importance de la structure quand tu considères, est-ce qu'il y a vraiment une importance de la structure? Puis, la question à l'intérieur d'un lac, pour moi, c'est une chose qui est super importante aussi, puis temporairement, je pense que c'est aussi intéressant de le suivre. Temporel, c'est juste un autre niveau, mais je pense qu'il faut se poser cette question-là pour savoir, est-ce que, puis vraiment, de façon objective, est-ce que la structure a vraiment un impact? Puis, je pense qu'on était étonné de voir à quel point, oui, on y met au bout du paysage, ça le, euh, mais c'est sûr qu'il y a des trade-offs avec notre échantillonnage. Mm -hmm. 
Mais je pense que je suis à l'aise de la façon qu'on l'a qu approché. OK. Excellent. Euh, écoute, justement, parlant de, de compromis, de trade-off, est-ce euh, que ça, une, une étude comme ça aurait pu être entreprise, mais par exemple, Ardesson en a parlé un petit peu avant, à l'intérieur d'une seule région, avec une répétition plus grande. C'était, si tu voulais le refaire en, en incluant une dimension, euh, en, en augmentant tes effectifs à l'intérieur de chaque lac, comment tu t'y prendrais? Oui, bien, c'est bon, sûr qu'il y a toujours... Si, mettons, dans, dans un scénario idéal, je pense que c'était vraiment intéressant d'avoir toute cette variabilité-là, parce qu'on avait la, la région de Chapeauville au nord qui était complètement différente, puis on a vraiment trouvé une grande variabilité. Et dans un scénario idéal, comme je l'ai mentionné aussi tantôt, moi, je vais à leur faire, il y aurait certains lacs où je montrerais la, 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 la représentativité temporelle, peut-être avoir comme 5, 6 points, essayer de voir c'est quoi le minimum qu'on pourrait avoir pour essayer de voir un peu les deux. Mais je garderais cette. Je trouvais que cette, le gradient qu'on est capable de couvrir était unique, puis ça nous a vraiment permis de voir des choses. Fait que je garderais ça si, bien sûr, dans un objectif où toutes les ressources sont toujours limitées, puis c'est jamais possible de faire tout ça. Mais je pense que ça, ça pourrait être intéressant de, de voir une région, mais c'est sûr que nos trois régions sont différentes. Fait. C'est sûr que ce, qu on, on, ce serait intéressant de mettre à l'intérieur d'une région, mais c'est ça, quelle région choisir ou quoi. C'est sûr que là, comme on disait tantôt, on a l'Abitibi, qui est une région beaucoup plus productive, mais flat. On a, la, euh, fait que là, la, où la, et là, on a euh, la, la Chicoutimi, beaucoup plus de flots parce qu'il y a beaucoup plus de, 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 de montagnes. Fait que là, la dispersion est vraiment différente, euh, l'effet d'environnement. Fait que choisir une région, je ne sais pas, c'est sûr que ça, ça, ça pourrait se faire être une région, mais moi, idéalement, j'aimerais ça augmenter la reproduction. Euh, Temporel, mais à la même échelle. Okay. Euh, le pouvoir de généralisation d'une inférence qui est basée sur une approche fondée sur l'analyse des traits fonctionnels, tu insistes beaucoup là-dessus dans ta thèse, et tu te présentes comme un, un élément fort, notamment dans ton premier chapitre, et, et ça, ça me suit par la suite dans les, dans les trois autres. Euh, pourquoi euh, une approche de traits fonctionnels, je, je veux encore entendre. En fait, tu as répondu en partie à ma question, mais pourquoi une approche très fonctionnelle, c'est vraiment plus porteur qu'une approche taxonomique pour tirer des généralisations? Puis à quelle échelle c'est plus porteur? Bien, c'est ça. Je pense que... A... Oui, en tout cas, ben, moi, vraiment, moi, je crois fort, c'est sûr que... Puis... <rire> Au-delà de la moyenne. <rire> pour moi, je trouve que ça fait beaucoup de sens de dire... Puis ça fait beaucoup de sens de dire... c'est c'est ces traits-là, mais ça dépend aussi, le choix des traits est toujours quelque chose de, de piqué. Mais bon, si on parle d'interaction trophique, qui était un des intérêts dans quoi j'ai étudié, euh, les espèces interagissent avec, pour moi, ça, les espèces interagissent avec leur environnement par l'interface de ces traits-là. C'est ce qui font qu'ils interagissent, c'est ce qui font qu'ils affectent leur, leur environnement. Et je trouve que c'est vraiment un, un niveau où c'est vraiment là que ça se passe. Tu sais. Puis, surtout, à notre échelle où on travaillait, je pense que c'est encore plus intéressant parce qu'on a des fois, puis on a, on a remarqué, on a des régions, on a, on a des espèces qui sont seulement présentes dans une région, des espèces qui sont présentes dans une autre région. Mais quand on regarde au niveau fonctionnel, avec nos traits fonctionnels en tout cas, mais les traits fonctionnels, la plupart, il y a quelques-uns qui ne sont pas dans les trois régions, mais la plupart sont, ont une couverture partout. Donc, mais c'est sûr qu'on est à, à très haute résolution de traits fonctionnels, mais ça, ça nous permet vraiment de dire, OK, on a ces espèces-là qui sont différentes, mais qui ont les mêmes fonctions. Et ça permet de cette généralisation qui n'aurait pas été possible au niveau taxonomique parce qu'on aurait dit, OK, on a cette espèce-là, là, cette espèce-là, là, là donc on voit cette différence-là. Mais là, on dit, OK, mais ils font peut-être la même chose dans l'écosystème. Mais c'est sûr qu'il y a une assomption derrière ça. C'est sûr que c'est très, tu sais, on, on, monte, on monte au bon niveau. Donc, c'est sûr qu'on manque des choses. Puis on dit que ces deux espèces-là sont équivalentes au niveau fonctionnel, mais ils ont probablement des différences. C'est sûr que le choix, à ce niveau-là, le choix des traits fonctionnels est important, mais à notre, à notre niveau, je pense que c'est une approche qui était vraie, qui est beaucoup plus informative. Puis pour moi, je trouve ça beaucoup plus informatif de dire, bien, on a une augmentation de un certain type de filtration, plutôt de dire, bien, telle espèce de daphnia a augmenté. Je trouve que d'un point de vue aussi mécanistique, de on, comprendre les mécanismes, ça aide aussi à comprendre les mécanismes. Il y a des traits qui sont très simples. Je vais à ça, alors des traits beaucoup plus dans la vie, mais ça représente un, un, un gros défi. C'est une convaincue. <rire> Dernière question dans, dans cette première ronde. Souvent, tu nous parles de, de production, de productivité, ouais. de biomasse, de rate of production. En fait, tu n'as pas mesuré nécessairement le taux de productivité ou le taux de production. Ouais. Euh, concrètement, ouais, là, je veux dire, euh, s'il y avait un mot qui se dégageait de, de cette histoire, de cette boîte de, de fonction d'écosystème, puis lequel tu utiliserais? C'est intéressant parce que je pense qu'on a tellement eu de débats à propos de la nomenclature 
avec différentes personnes. Moi, je suis heureux de voir ça. Avec Paul, avec lui, avec Akash, qui est le poste avec qui on travaillait. Puis, en fait, je pense que même la, la thèse représente l'historique de ce changement-là. Parce qu'on a, a changé avec au début, on appelait ça la production. Parce que la production, parce que la production, c'est juste la, la, la biomasse qui est là. Puis, on a changé. Fait que je pense que moi, le terme que j'utilise maintenant, c'est « biomass production rate », donc le taux de production de biomasse. <rire> Au lieu de la productivité, mais, mais, mais c'est un débat. Mais, mais, mais dans la littérature, c'est pas un débat qui est... Le monde utilise productivité, production, 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 euh, specific production à toutes les sources. C'est très dur et ça, je pense que pas de... c'est vraiment difficile. Ça va pour moi. Monsieur Del Giorgio. Thank you, Nico, for, for a very, very interesting and very pleasant uh, presentation. And, uh, and, and uh, well, the thesis we have discussed a lot, so, uh, but it was also very good. Thank you so much. Um, one of the premises of, of the work is, um, is to explore if there is to explore this link that may exist between some aspect of diversity could be taxonomic or, or functional and some some aspect of the performance of this of this community and so the question is posed uh, uh, is there this uh, link because this is what we are all looking for but if i turn the question around and i ask you is there any circumstance where the structure And who is there could not have could not have any in, uh, any link to to what they do. Is there any circumstance where where this could be true? The, where the absence of a link between these two things is that possible? I, I guess it is. And to me, there's two things. And if we go to the to the SEMs, there is the absence of the links. But I, as I mentioned, if based on the idea that some species are more efficient than others or they co I think the composition will always be uh, to me related at least in these uh, sorry to these uh, ideas but okay if, uh, I, I can approach that here and because there, there's two ways there, there's two things here right so there's the idea that okay I think composition because of the different characteristics of the species, will have an effect on, on function. But the question is that, can we assume this as a black box or not? And I think situation where it can be assumed as a black box. For example, here we have the effect on the environment on composition, and you have the function. If, by using environment, you're able to, to, uh, to not control, but if this link between environment and community structure is really important, then you don't need to really look at community structure, because by using environment, you will be able to characterize that box. And then, Using this link, you, you, you're able to characterize everything. The thing is that if you have non-linear response, like for example, if some species have a different response, and then you may need to know the structure because then depending on which, which species is there, the, the relationship with temperature, for example, may be different. So there is uh, there's many different situations where we can consider or not that box. I think it's, to me at least, composition is always important, as I mentioned, But there is a situation when you can, I, there is, of course, many situations when you can only look at the relationship between an environment and a function without needing to assess a uh, community. But to me, community will be, there is, depending on who's there, but it could be only the, the, the effect of environment. I don't, I don't know if it makes sense. Right. Well, then, um, it, it, if I reformulate the question one more time, then yeah. uh, that means that. Um, if community structure simply responds to environment, it yeah. simply responds to environment yeah. uh, and results in a certain performance, then uh, it is really the environment that matters. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, but then the, the circumstance where the community structure might actually add something is when uh, there are other, fa other factors uh, that are separate from the factors that are the basic environmental factors exactly. like, yeah. that actually are influencing community structure separately yeah. from what they do. So um, 
what would be what would those factors be in the case of your uh, because you know chlorophyll you have more more greenness and more stuff for everything you have more of everything right of course so that's what, but what would be the factors that might independently modulate community structure such that then that becomes uh, for any given set of environmental parameters your community structure is actually very Right. What would those types of be? But in I, the case of, of your study? Yeah, there, I think there's many potential ways. Which, for example, we can think, I think interaction can be a really, a really important way. So if we imagine in a lake, it could, if we have a really shallow lake, for example, and we have a fish kill over a winter, right? It could have an important effect on the structure of that. And then without really any effect on the environment. And then you can have this trophic interaction either within phytoplankton or with phytoplankton and fish that can affect structure without any effect on the environment. And that can then, at the end, affect production. So uh, you, don't, you don't talk very much about fish. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and yeah, this, this is, I think, and we're. But we, you don't have fish. Okay, we don't have fish. And I think it would be so, so interesting. And, and this is something, but you know, like, we always need to be realistic and doing fish on all those things wouldn't be possible. And, but this is, I think, something that is missing. And if we go back to the first chapter, and this is something that, that, that we talk about in the thesis, when we talk about the effect of morphometry on zooplankton. Mm -hmm. So we say it's morphometry because we don't have fish, but we know that fish respond strongly to morphometry. So that morphometry may be fish, and this would be, I think, super important. And I don't know of any fish of, of any study, and it could be at a, at a smaller scale, but I think we need study that we study zooplankton, phytoplankton. Oh, <laughs> and, and fish at a, another, so, another side. I was going to actually, that was one my next question, because, well, actually, my major question in this realm would be what we are discussing now is whether you think that from your data emerges evidence that this community structure is being varied by things other than the things that make production vary. Yeah. This is my question, mm -hmm. whether you, you see evidence of that. Uh, in your own work, because if community structure is just varying by the things that we know make so plankton production vary, yeah. then well, uh, the two things are kind of co-varying, and you can put lines on both ways in your SEM, and that's, right. there's right. no problem with that. Yeah. But I want to know your opinion as well, whether you see evidence that there are things other than the basic things that we know already control production that may be modulating. Um, uh, structure in such a way that structure now becomes important. Yeah, and so the way you can do it with SCM, so you can, and this is something we look at, and is that, so you, you can see if this link between environment and structure explain all also this thing, right? And in our case, it's, um, so in our case, it's, so you multiply, right? So it, it, half of that relationship is explained by the environment. So you would miss, miss half of it without character, without using a uh, composition. But of course, does it mean that if you were to measure 30 other mineral variable, maybe you would be able to characterize. So with the variable that we have, and based on the idea, so we, we measure the variable that are known to be important to production, uh, community was adding more information than using only environment. Okay. And the, the, the link to lake science, can we explore that a little bit more? Because that's an intriguing link. I mean, why would uh, zooplankton don't choose, right? Well, they do. Yeah, well, I, I like small lakes or, <laughs> or big lakes. What, what, would, what are the things that would... It must be an indicator of something that we don't know. No, right? what, an, an what, uh, what might that be? I, I have a few, I have, I have some hypotheses, and it's, it's interesting to me that it's a really important of both function and structure. So there's really something that I, I think, like, it's a bit more known, the effect of that. So I was expecting that to be important, but really lake size is more important than that in, in here. And there's, my first hypothesis, it could be because it, it could be because of fish. So fish are known, so, right, in, in larger lake, maybe you have, uh, like, yes, we have like, maybe the, the refuge are different, and then we always sample the center of the lake, right? That could also have an impact on, on that, how it represents. So it could be an effect of fish, but also I think that something that Maybe it's something that is integrating because we know that if we think about a reactor and something, this is just an idea that I had, 
maybe that's in a small lake. Because what we find find is that in a small small lake production is higher. So maybe that in a small lake everything is just more concentrated, right? So you have this effect of everything is just more more proximal, everything is more concentrated, and you have this effect. It could be fish, it could be many things, but it would be really interesting to to investigate that effect of right. And, um, uh, along those same lines. Um, um, you have done some work on a lot, in other words, in in retracing some of the, the, the resources and so on. I mean, you have focused a lot between the zooplankton and phytoplankton. Now that that comes back to the issue that, in fact, I wanted to ask you why do you think that the, their biogeography should be linked? Yeah, and this is a this is a really interesting question. You know, like I presented that that talk in many places at the ASL last year. And each time I have people coming to me and people saying, oh, I'm really impressed that you're not linked. I, 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 don't, I think something is wrong. And there are people that I'm saying, uh, saying, of course. Right. Why are you expecting they should be linked? They are not. And maybe it's just that, you know, like coming from a, you know, like you always learn in the knowledge that phytoplankton and zooplankton, strong interaction, and based the PEG model, right? So you have the PEG model, so you have interaction are specific that constrain the distribution. And my expectation, maybe it's not that surprising, but it was never tested. And to me, it was surprising. And other people like you say that, no, it's not surprising. This is what I expected. But to me, it's really interesting to, say, to see that these two groups are interacting and they're just not, not linked. But not linked at that level. At that level. There but, is a, yeah. but this is where I, I wanted to see your views about a lot in the sense that um, we can focus on so plankton, phytoplankton, uh, this company, but we ourselves have yeah. uh, seen that in this lake, so plankton uh, feed a lot. Right. Somehow there's terrestrial carbon coming in, to the yeah. tube, which is not necessarily mediated by the so plankton. So some of your functional things uh, and your links there, how could we add that in this in this uh, universe that you have there? You mean, you mean adding this other component? Yes. Yeah, of uh, course. And could that be linked to lake size? Yeah, maybe, maybe you're right. That, and you no, know, like and related to that, like we know that in lake size, usually, right, you have more colored DOC, you have more DOC, and we so we first try to see can we replace can we replace lake size by DOC or color, and it's not the case. So we did something more complex than that, and maybe in those small lakes, I don't remember that if, if we found a relationship between lake size and alloctony, but I, I don't think so. But it would be really interesting to maybe we, and maybe we need to do it when we have the result for the whole for the same. It's the same lakes, and maybe you're right. Maybe there's there's a shift between feeding on on, on phytoplankton to re rely, rely, relying more on, on that other side and feeding other species. It, it's yeah. it's it, it would be super interesting to because you're right that we focus on phytoplankton. I I, I was done uh, many times because this is easier to characterize, but it would be super interesting to see. Maybe it is something that would explain the original. One sense. last question, perhaps before. Uh, um, Overall, in your data set, this is something I, I don't remember this quite much. Um, uh, did you observe a, a relationship between taxonomic diversity and functional diversity? Yeah. And uh, was it strong or was it in the direction that you expected? Uh, no, so, so, as I was saying before, like, all, all the diversity indices are positively correlated. Like it's, and when you measure evenness, and it's, but there is a, also a lot of variability between the two. And, also, as I showed in the first chapter, um, no, but, okay, this is a bit different, but um, yeah, so there is a correlation between the two. Um, and evenness is, is correlated to functional evenness. And, but we always find that, for example, in ISCM, that functional diversity measures are stronger, stronger predictor than uh, taxonomical diversity measures. But they are correlated, that's for sure. It's, mm -hmm. right, and it, I think it makes sense. People are always trying to find Diversity measures are not correlated or like orthogonal to the other, but diversity is diversity, right? It's, it's yeah. okay. um, so big day, thank you. Um, it's been a long time getting here, and uh, it's been great to see you develop over the years and go from that. Student came to that office. I was at McGill on a sabbatical, and uh, not quite sure where we were going. And anyway, here we are. So um, it's been incredible. You've developed incredible taxonomic skills, which are 
<laughs> very useful. Um, statistical skills and expertise, and uh, you've really developed as a scientist and taken this and run with it. And so um, thank you. It was a great presentation. I hadn't seen it before, and it was uh, very enjoyable. Um, so I'm just going to ask very few questions, but I have one in particular coming back to the functional issue. Uh, so there's some people, there's one sort of school of thought that is we can skip all the taxonomic information. We can, we don't need taxonomic symbol, or we could just broadly classify organisms like plankton based on their morphology. So you can look, you still look at a microscope, but you say, okay, that's like a box made of flagella, or it's just a box. Um, or for your zooplankton, it's going to be, you know, it's got it's got legs to move, or it doesn't, or whatever. You know, it's going to be some sort of very broad classification. So I'm wondering how you feel about that compared to the sort of approach you've taken, and is that the future? We still need taxonomy. Yeah, that that is, that is a good question, and you know, like, uh, and you know, like when you when you in front of your microscope. You would hope that you would skip taxonomy and just say, be able to go at a higher level. Yeah. It's, it's kind of painful. Yeah, right? Yeah. Sometimes you get used to it. But, or having something that would do it for you. And, but I think it's, we need to be careful with that. And, you know, like the work we did with the mining company, so they would go to the taxonomic level. And it's, should, should we tell them, like, okay, but the, on, on the function matters, and don't go to the taxonomy, but there's the risk of, mi um, of missing something, uh, something that happens. So, this is something, I, so I think function is really uh, important to, uh, to understand, to, to, really, to, to, to generalize. But So what we did in our approach, so we really went to the species level and after that group that uh, the, the functional level. And I think it's a, it's a good way to do it, so go at the species, because there's also relevant at the species level. Because in a perfect world, when you would characterize all the functions that are relevant, to an, in, in your ecosystem for the response and the effect of a community, then you could skip taxonomy. But it's, it's not the case. Right? We have, for now, a really rough function. And I think we still need taxonomy. You still need this to know who species are there. And, and just maybe also, like just if we, if we keep the idea of our, what we did. So as I, I, I said, so we, we went to the species level, then we grouped them roughly. But then maybe in, in five years, we know other traits for the species. So we can go back and say, okay, let's look at the, these other traits. So we can also go back and see, and then reconstruct that functional or So I think it, it's it's still relevant to go at the taxonomical level, even if uh, if we use many function. But it's something I'm really, on the, on the one side, I don't want to do more microscope. <laughs> but on the other side, I know it's important. And we need that expertise of taxonomists because it's, it's been hard to develop, but yeah, it's it's not an easy question. And what about the, the phylogenetic diversity? So that's something that you didn't incorporate. Um, do you think it would have been useful? What are your, your thoughts on that approach versus yeah. The functional? Uh, yeah, and we 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 calculated the phylogenetic diversity at the end. We didn't, we didn't use it, and it's just phylogenetic diversity is interesting. Uh, Again, in a perfect world, if you have all the relevant functional traits, I think functional diversity is the best because when you use phylogenetic diversity, you're just assuming that the function and the phylogeny are, are consistent. So if when you don't have good traits for what you're measuring, I think it would be interesting to, um, to understand phylogeny to really see how, the, how the, this, this diversity changes. But in my case, I think it's, and it's also in the same thing that I explained that I covered with Pia and, and with Jason is that in order and with Allison is that in order to to look at the mechanism, the pattern, I think that function are more informative, right? And really enable you to really understand the mechanisms. Uh, but I think it would be really interesting. And there's study out, out there comparing the two and sometimes some people say functional is better, depending on the, the trait that you have, sometimes it's phylogenetic, but I I, I after looking with all those here with functional diversity and seeing the patterns, I think it's really informative, and I, I really like that approach, even with simple traits. Traits. Um, unfortunately, a lot of my questions were asked already. So, uh, the the mining response. Uh, do you think dispersal limitation on zooplankton may be driving that? So, hmm. you know, you're not seeing a response in them. You're seeing the phytoplankton. Do you think it like? If we'd have a dispersal trait, 
Right, dispersal limitation. Would that you think answer the question? Uh, that is that is that is a good point. Mm -hmm. That is uh, so you think that maybe because the reason why there is no response in zooplankton could be because of dispersal or yeah, but just you know as the conditions are changing, the phytoplankton can move in and and change those communities. Mm -hmm. The zooplankton perhaps they're just not making. Yeah. It. Hmm. No, that is a good point. I didn't talk about that. So you, you're saying that maybe that would be a relevant trait to see mm -hmm. a change in the zooplankton community. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe this, there's that trait that, yeah, that, that is a good point. But uh, if, if we look at the, the, the even at, at the species composition of, of zooplankton, it didn't change also. So I think we capture well what, what's going on, but you're right. It could be uh, also a special effect. That's a really good point. Mm -hmm. So we're not really losing species. Or adding species. Nothing major. Yeah. There is maybe one or two lakes where there is there is some small variation in abundance. So th there is differences, but nothing like like phytoplankton that you would expect, like a change that is consistent in space and in time, and that it's changing gradually in every lake. Uh, nothing that is something really minor. And our our, our our hypothesis is that mean maybe that just that. Um, the change that happened in phytoplankton just favored the same zooplankton community that was there before. So that, that's one possibility, it's just that it reinforced that. But, yeah. Um, so can we put up the slide of the mining one with the phytoplankton? Yep. Of time just to work up what Of course. Here. So, just looking at that, is there is there any way you could look at that graph? And you had talked about the effects of the mine. Could you look at that figure and possibly come to a conclusion or inference that there's no effect of the mine? Yeah, you're right. That it's it's. I think it's a nice way to look at it, but it's there. There is things that are that are a bit weird, right? So it's when it started, all the lakes are are somehow different from reference lake, and then the seem to converge uh, to reference lakes. So there's a lot of variability uh, earlier in the, in, in, the, in the thing. And there's people are always asking me about this 2014 question. So we're reporting it. And so we see that. So here you can see 2014, there's a major shift. And 2014 seems to be, a, so they, and this is something that is always something that happens. So they changed the taxonomist in 2014. <laughs> So when we, when we work with that, we were still trying to figure it out because it's happening. Here we can see for phytoplankton, but uh, oh, you miss it also. But same thing in rotifer. Oh, it's less clear because uh, but rotifers, there is, I think, 10 species of rotifers that were never identified before and that they all appear in 2014. <laughs> so 2014 is a really weird year, and I put it just because like, it's a bit of but this is but this is just probably a problem. But you, you read that at the beginning, there is some variability. But really playing with that data, I'm really confident in looking at how it changes, in, it really changes in space and in time toward like all those like converging to the more proximal lake. And very, really playing with that data, I, I'm really confident that it was a mine, an effect of the mine uh, activities. And also the group that was favored here, so small centric diatoms, are known to respond to nitrate enrichment. So both on the mechanistic, it was a, we were able to explain from a mechanic standpoint, and also how the change happened, both ready in space and time. Uh, I'm confident that it's, it's something that really was the effect of the mind. Yeah. The, uh, well, uh, I'm sure you've seen papers by Dean Marshall saying, you know, be careful ta taxonomic changes and even within a taxonomist of learning through time <laughs> change. Right. 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 Yeah. Okay. Well, what, you know, so when I when I look at this, I, I, I kind of see things different before the line and then uh, and kind of done. And then it seems like everything's kind of increasing. And, you know, I just wonder if that's mine or if that's just a, a broader pattern, but you didn't see that pattern in the reference list. But yeah, so, and the other thing also, so this line is the reference thing, but of course, those lakes are changing, right? So this is not stable in time. So if you have a change in reference lakes, then it will like shift. So because there is change in time in the reference lakes, and 
but it's really the distance from, from the, the, the reference leg that is changing. But the change in the reference leg are really minor. But what is interesting is that, you know, like these, this group, this, the small centric diatoms, are known to respond to nitrate. And in those legs, there is nitrate deposition. Just, just from the atmosphere, right? And so you have a, this, this increase in, in this group is just major. So it's starting from 5% to 90%. But on, on the 20 years, it's also increasing in, in reference size. So there is also this variation that is happening on another scale, but really it's really minor from what is happening in, in the lakes connected to the mine. But you're right, that, that, that line is moving. So we have the impression it's stable, but it's just, yeah, it's moving. Um, I've got a couple of quick questions or a bigger question. Um, so in, I think in chapter two, two or three in your models, you had that uh, the mean body size of zooplankton was negatively correlated with zooplankton production. Yep. But you had an identity effect which suggested defiltration is positively correlated with zooplankton. Is mean body size, I would think that a, a larger community body size would be correlated with Daphnia. Yeah, you're so, right. So how do you how do you resolve that, that, that? Is that is a great question, and in fact, and this is something that we may need to uh, to investigate because if you remember, in the second chapter we have size, and here when we add the identity effect, in fact, we lose the effect of size, right? So we say that size kind of control for this, but you're right that Daphnia are a big organism, and we find a positive relationship here. Maybe that's uh, it's, an, uh, it's it's a very good question. Chiders are, are smaller, but it's 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 a very good question that we shift from a negative to a, a positive relationship. And yeah, we, we need to investigate this because uh, I, have, I have no answer. It's a good question. And it, could it be related to, to the effect of diversity? You expect it would be interesting to see if there's a relation between uh, functional evenness and size because I haven't I haven't looked at what whether these three is related to mean size, but that's a good point. And when Daphnia are in higher proportion, mean size is definitely higher because Busmina are the smallest, smallest, and in our example, for sure, Daphnia are the biggest cladocera. I don't, I don't have an answer. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. <laughs> so in your models, you, you're explaining maximum of 40 to 50 percent with your models. And uh, depending on the, the production model or the yeah, 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 yeah. production model. Right. And in those models, uh, I think you were saying more farm team may be a proxy for fish community, which so so what do you think is is making up the other fifty percent of unexplained variation? Yeah, that's and I think like of course like temporal variation would be really important and making that that other and of course like you know like there is error everywhere, right? So we know that the way we measure production, there is error involved, like we only uh, mainly include um, uh, somatic growth, so there is also other error, but I would say that temporal, I think the temporal component would be a major component. And also maybe other levels of, of structure, other and non variables, but yes, it's, so I, I was quite happy to be able to explain 50% of that, that's good, but you're right, I think the temporal would be the missing component for sure. So, so in the lakes, you do have, getting back to the multiple yeah. sampling, yeah. could you run your model on just those subset of lakes and see if, if your R squared bumps up and if the time time becomes a, a more important relative contributor to that? But you mean to the lake where we have many samples? Yes. Mm -hmm. But with three points, I guess it would be hard. But we could, we could actually apply the model, but you're right. And see, uh, because we only have three points. This is the thing that is, we would need a bit more points, I guess, to apply the model. But yeah, we. we it could be possible and and see how well using those variables at yeah, two different points, how we can predict production in time. That, 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 that could be a way to characterize. Yeah, you're right. It, it could change during the season. Yeah, that's a really good that, that's a really good suggestion. Use a model that was already developed, but apply it to the yeah, yeah, that's a really good suggestion. And then um, my last question, it goes back to um, Chapter two, which you think you know, I reviewed for the journal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I signed it, so it's, it's, it's a secret. <laughs> uh, yeah, signing signing makes makes the re my reviews a lot more positive and 
So one thing in, in kind of looking over this again that popped out to me, thinking about uh, you were framing the chapter in terms of well, these, these other production models, uh, the one I did with Aura and then the shooter name model yeah, yeah, yeah. are you know cohort based based on species. Um, and so they're missing the community part yeah. of it. Yeah. So, but it, it occurred to me that when when those models are used, where we are, we're taking a net sample, we're measuring everything in there, and getting the, for instance, the body size and the temperature is at, and then we just say, okay, where are you on the regression and what temperature right. at, and get a P to B and then sum it all up. Yeah. And when we're, when you look at, you're essentially applying that to. The regression is made up of Daphne, of coke pods, of mice, of all these things of different body sizes, and then we, we apply that to the net sample of everything we find body sizes. Right. And I read a little bit on the, the SAS free papers based on the title of Vice, and it seems like that model is also developed by looking at Daphne and coke pods and building a regression model. And then you take a water sample and apply that and say, okay, this is it. So. I guess I'm left wondering, because you posited the paper around population production versus total community, is there really a difference between applying the two different models? Uh, that is a very good question. I think that if you go in the lake and you're able to use the court method to measure the production of every population, then you would that, that would, you should get something similar, right? And it should be as good. And even if you account for somatic growth, it should be even like a more representative. But the thing is that I think our, our, my view on this is more as a model, right? And applying a model that is developed at the population level is interesting to when you, you measure for a population. But if you apply, I think like, and there is paper that did that. So if you're going to LA and then you're using your composition, and you're applying okay, population model to that composition, to that population, to that population, and then you sum it to get that, that you get community production. And at that level, then I think this is more, there's more problem with that because of added, and we talk about interactions between the species, and there's something that we may, may be missing at that level. And this is why we wanted to integrate, then we, we wanted to ask a question. Um, uh, we wanted to ask that question. So, if we is is the same thing at population and at the the, the community, and we did something very rough with the the planet dolly model, but because we didn't have a very good measure to really compare. But I and this is really at that level of the problem when people are really summing it as a model, not not measuring it. So, so when you're doing a population measure to get the production. Yep. But then when you string them together into like a body size model, right. is that model now still a population level model or you're applying it across your, your, your kind of species populations go out the door because you're now on this metric of body size where species may not matter. So, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm pushing a little bit on this because I, I, yeah. one could argue that, that although the estimates are based on populations, the application of the, the overall model is more of a community-based approach because yeah. you're, you're applying the lengths of everything you find to that. Right. So. Yeah, yeah, my view is, yeah, so exactly. So because we have this good relationship between the two, we're really going at the, at the community level, right? And, uh, but yeah, for like, I think both are interesting, but yeah, I think we're really able to really measure production. And because that relationship between size and production is so consistent. I think this is what enables us to really go at the at, at the community level. But yeah, have you? I, I know you you were applying the plant downing model to your data. Have you applied the other two models? The the shing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We 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 applied all the models, and uh, some are really higher. Some are, but it's always. The, the patterns are always consistent. So we used the plan and dotting because it was the one that was more similar to the idea of a community production. But yeah, we applied all model. And um, they are somehow consistent. Uh, your model and the model of uh, Shren and Inc. are 
very good. And the other one that was developed we across another model that was developed in oceans using only temperature. I don't remember the name. And that one was for you, uh, Hernandez. I'm not sure. I think it was Hernandez yeah, the model. But yeah, it's, it's very close, right? We're getting estimates that are close to what we're getting. Okay, um, so I'll just follow up on a production question. Um, so I, I was thinking about um, your production estimates, and one thing that I started to think about was the generation time. And I was wondering your thoughts on how average generation time of zooplankton functional relates to zooplankton production. In the sense that, you mean that the fact how fast the, the computer is renewing? How fast biomass is turning over? Right. And what? Okay, I'm not sure I'm getting the question. So, you're saying that how generation? Because like we're measuring every time they mold, right? So. Right. So, for example, um, um, right. apnea and Hydora's filtration strategies and identity, you know. As significant in the model, yeah. rather than, for example, feeding strategies of calorie copulates of longer generation times. Right. And so this is where I thought perhaps a uh, life table. I, I was just thinking oh, about the that's, 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 versus the life table approach, that's and, and where where there might be gaps. And to me, that was where a potential gap could be because the life tables, unless you find a way to statistically parse it out. With your kind of bias, perhaps life tables would more accurately take into consideration the effect of generation time on biomass turnover. Like just following up. On yeah, that, that that is a good question. Yeah, if I think about it. So, uh, but you're right; it could have an impact. But if we think about the community level model, right? So, if even the, no matter what is their generation time, if they produce that enzyme, and this is related to how much biomass they produce. Then it should the relationship between between those groups. So it means that when even when you have more daphnia, they have a shorter generation time. So, but it still means that the, when you have more daphnia, more biomass is produced, even if they have shorter generation time, because this is each time. So I think uh, our relationship between like, the, the, those functional types and production is still valid, to my understanding, because it just means. But you're right that. It would be interesting then to look at this aspect from the, the generation time, and it probably probably play a role in there, be, and probably like that those species with a longer generation time just produce less biomass, and maybe also something we're not accounting. So maybe also they have more somatic growth, something we're not accounting, and less biomass growth. So this is also something that that yeah, and we're doing it. I think, and this is something we didn't do, but we would do to egg counts, I think, to better account mm -hmm. for the, the, that part of production, the right. cannabinoids and the cyclopoids, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, so now I'm going to kind of move across and follow up on a question that Paul asked. Yes. Uh, related to lake size, um, which you correlate in morphology, which you correlated with um, perhaps fish influencing the zooplankton, and, and he was asking about all these other factors that perhaps also influenced it well, like a lock thing. Um, and so I'm just going to kind of bring another level in, which is, you know, how do you think um, lake morphometry influenced the abundance of mixotrophic um, algal groups? Yeah. Not only from the perspective of a lock thing, since they can use those resources, but also from the perspective of the actual morphometry itself, when you consider their functional group, one of the traits considered were their weak swimming skills. Hmm. So, yeah, you know. A, and how? Uh, because like we had an exotrophy of phytoplankton as a. Yeah. And what is it? I don't remember if it was responding to morphometry. It, it did. Um, so let's see. Well, it was responding to nothing actually here. But. Yeah. Uh, uh, <laughs> but it was flagellated species. Yeah. So that, that's, that is. Yeah. So huh. yeah, flagellated species. Yeah. Now that is a, that is a good point. So maybe even within phytoplankton, mm -hmm. without even going to the. So it may be something. Hey, right? Because it, and it's interesting that those flagellated, which are pretty common, are re only responding also to mm -hmm. more. It could be bottom up or, or top down, I guess. Right. But yeah. 
Yeah, that's a that's a very good point. Okay, and then um, as a final question, I just I want to come back to the diamond mines. Yep. And um, and think about uh, the role of lake position in the landscape. Right. Because in those diamond mines, you're dealing with lake chains. Yep. Right. And um, and when we think of lake chains, so now in this question, I'm going to bring the fish back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when 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 diamond mines are created, often they take a headwater lake and they drain it completely. Exactly. Yeah. And so if we think about that, and we think about what are the role of headwater lakes and lake chains? Mm -hmm. Are they sources? Do they matter? How do they affect the lakes yeah. below them? Yeah. So, you know, what are your thoughts on that? So you, you think about the effect of removing a lake that was there and just the effect of removing that thing. Yeah, that, that, that is a very good point. And, and you think that it could impact even more fish well, so you, when you looked at your study, you were focused on nitrate concentrations related to depth of blasting of dust. Yeah. But there's other impacts associated with diamond mining as yeah. well, yeah, which yeah. is full-scale removal of habitat, including lifting out fish species that may be spawning in the headwaters mm. and acting as a source to lower-level lakes. Yeah. And by, so what, are, what happens when you move, remove top yeah. predators from systems like that? Yeah, it, it, you're right, it, it could be a major impact, and especially that you're right. So they remove, the, the Edwater Lake was completely drained, and then there's the first three lakes in the catchment, and I, I, it's not shown on the map, but they used to be called lakes, but now they're, they're called containment facility, right? So, it's, so they, they remove four lakes right. from the catchment. But the thing is that, so they, they, they measured fish every three years, right. and there was no changes in fish composition also. Okay. Uh, I didn't in think, the lower lakes. There was no change in composition, but you're right, it could be a big impact. I think especially for fish. Uh, for the water quality, the impact, I think, it, of course, like uh, the concentration will increase of each of nutrients and everything in the lakes, but I think like the, the impact of the mine was the main thing affecting water quality. But you're right that for fish it could be important, uh, but it was noted that there was no big variation in fish. Uh, I think they were really surprised that you see no variation in fish and zooplankton. This was something that we didn't yeah. expect. And so we're and so then if, if you can then then take fish out. Then. Yeah. Then can you talk about big morphometry in that system? You mean controlling for for so, fish? So so fish are out because in your yeah. landscape level stuff you're like okay morphometry would affect maybe the the fish community. Yeah. But so then now you've got kind of an impacted other study system yeah. where in this particular case, in other mines, they are impacting the fish communities. But yeah. in this particular system, maybe they didn't. Yeah. So now fish are kind of, they were always there yeah, the yeah. same. So fish effect is out. But you've got lakes of different morphometry. Yeah. Yeah. But morphometry isn't did you see an effect with morphometry? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we included morphometry and, and uh, actually we see the same thing as as in the first chapter. Zooplankton is responding only to morphometry. But not through the fish. But maybe, uh, it, uh, but it depends because the change, uh, we didn't include directly the, the fish. So it's possible because like, the zooplankton community before and after is the same. So maybe we haven't looked at that question directly. So maybe more, so more forage is important. So maybe we could use the data to see, okay, maybe the different, because they, they have different fish composition. It's not just not changing. So maybe that you're right, that the fish composition that is different in all those lakes explain why just from day one, they add different composition in zooplankton. It's just that there was no change in time. But you're right that the effect of morphology, and maybe it's, it would be a good place to test it actually, because they add the fish data. Exactly. And to see, to really see, is it the composition of fish that is explaining that, that morphology? You're, you're right, I, did, I never thought about it because we never had access to the fish data, but they, they add it, yeah. That's a really good point. Okay, so that concludes my Merci. Euh, je vais y aller avec trois brèves questions. La première question, elle, elle est liée à... Tu nous dis, tu as répondu aux membres du comité à toute entreprise que tes indices de diversité, que ce soit l'équitabilité, la diversité, la composition taxonomique ou la composition fonctionnelle, pointent dans la même direction, sont fortement corrects. 
OK. Euh, Qu'en est-il de, de, de la similarité de la composition, et non pas de, du comportement de ces indices-là, mais de la similarité de la composition taxonomique versus fonctionnel ouais. dans ton système de lac? Si on vient, par exemple, à ton chapitre 1. Oui, je l'entends, je dis, tu parles de où on compare la, la, les ouais. différents ouais, ça c'est Ça, c'est vraiment quelque chose que, qui nous a surpris, qu'on ne s'attendait pas du tout. Euh, tu n'as pas présenté ça de façon spécifique, là, mais c'est dans la tête. Oui, c'est ça. Je vais aller la figure ici. Euh, c'est ça, dans le fond, on voit des. Et ça, c'est vraiment quelque chose qui nous a vraiment surpris à quel point. Puis un peu, c'est un peu en lien avec ce que j'ai répondu tantôt. On voit vraiment que les trois régions au niveau taxonomique, au niveau de l'eau plantant et de l'eau sont différentes. Donc, comme je disais, il y a des espèces qu'on ne trouve pas, mais aussitôt qu'on voit au niveau fonctionnel, les trois régions, on peut être plus capable de dire. Je pense que c'est ça. Donc, Ma, mon interprétation de ça serait vraiment qu'il y, y a des traits qui sont, donc il y a des espèces qui changent et qui, au niveau, en tout cas, pour les fonctions qu'on mesure, elles ne sont pas différentes entre les régions. Mm -hmm. Ça, ça démontre vraiment que bon, l'approche qu'on connaît peut-être mettre tout ensemble. Ça peut démontrer soit qu'on est vraiment capable de, de, de faire un, un niveau plus général Exactement. ou qu'on manque quelque chose. Ça pourrait être aussi. Tu sais, il y a les deux façons de la médaille, mais moi, moi j'étais content de voir ça, de dire, bon, OK. Fait que là, on est capable vraiment de... Mais je suis impressionnant en même temps. Je pense qu'il y a avoir des différences taxonomiques. Mais... Euh, moi, ce que je te répondrais, c'est que c'est fort intéressant que tu aies fait... Et tantôt, quand Béatrice te posait une question sur la taxonomie, ouais. c'est que le fait que tu aies les deux portraits, ça te donne une, profonde, ça donne une profondeur à ton travail. Ouais. Et, pense que autre, et, et ça, ça te permet de développer un argumentaire probablement encore plus fort sur mm. ton approche fonctionnelle. Ouais, bon ce, cela étant dit, c'est quand même intéressant de voir qu'au niveau... Euh, au niveau de ton phytoplancton, on voit vraiment un, un switch très, très fort se faire. Hein? Ouais. Une distinction très, très grande entre les régions quand tu regardes la, taxi, la, la taxonomie. Puis quand tu reviens sur l'aspect la, la, fonctionnel, tu as, as vraiment un mélange beaucoup plus euh, ouais. homogène. Par contre, au niveau du, du zooplancton, c'est un peu différent. Tu as quand même, as quand même un, un, un certain brassage de ton zooplancton d'une région à l'autre. Dès que tu regardes ta composition taxonomique. Moi, je trouve, je trouve ça assez intéressant en lisant la thèse. Tu n'as pas insisté là-dessus, ben, mais il y a une, une réponse différentielle. Mais il y a une affaire méthodologique ici, je peux juste mentionner que, vu qu'on a moins de lacs au niveau phyto que zoro, okay. on voit que c'est plus évident, mais le séparer. L'axe ici tombe dans le milieu, il y a un lac qui est côté. Fait, okay. En fait, statistiquement, c'est peut-être aussi, j'ai essayé plus de fois, mais ces points-là sont plus séparés entre les régions que le phytoplancton. Mais il y aura plus de il y a plus de points, en tout cas. Si on prend les premiers axes, c'est pour ça que je n'en ai pas trop parlé, parce qu'en théorie, ça, c'est plus séparé. Mais quand on regarde, c'est vrai que lui, ça, c'est comme. Il n'y a quasiment aucun overlap entre nos élèves. C'est parce que visuellement, en tout cas, quand ouais, on est ouais, mis ouais. la thèse, parce que tu fais ce commentaire-là pour commenter tes deux figures, mais la figure ne semble pas le montrer. Non, c'est bon. Ouais, OK, c'est bon. Euh, deuxième question. Euh, tu as parlé à plus d'une re, reprise pour expliquer un peu les résultats du chapitre 1 sur le découplage qu'il y a entre la réponse fonctionnelle de, euh, de tes euh, deux grands groupes, euh, phytoplancton et zooplancton. Tu as fait allusion à l'importance que les, la communauté de poissons pourrait éventuellement avoir dans ton système. Euh, on, en a, on vient d'en parler avec la question de la Russie. Euh, mais c'est resté là. là tu sais, je veux dire. Qu'est-ce qu qu qui pourrait expliquer, euh, -dire comment, comment la communauté de poissons pourrait influencer ce découplage-là? Ben, ben, en fait, mon idée là-dedans, c'était plus, euh, à, donc c'est un peu la, la question, est-ce que, est que Zooplancton répond à, à ses ressources ou à ses prédateurs? Mm -hmm. si, dans le fond, on pour, si dans le fond, on répond plus fortement à ses prédateurs, on, on manquerait vraiment qu'on qu ne voit pas de démonstration. Bon, donc la réponse, est-ce que... La réponse qu'on voit de morphométrie, mais en fond, c'est une interaction trophique, mais juste avec le niveau supérieur. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mais même chose, moi, je me serais toujours, moi, je me suis attendu que zooplancton, pour moi, c'est un intégrateur. Ça répond à la base du réseau trophique. On voit que le niveau du paysage n'est pas assez important. Ça répond à, à, au haut du réseau trophique. Est-ce qu'on est qu verrait qu'en fait, quand, ah oui, c'est plus le haut au niveau du paysage qui est important, ou est-ce qu'on verrait la même chose? En fait, donc, il n'y aurait pas tant d'interactions là. Puis c'est encore une fois, chacun, chaque communauté, moi, ça serait super intéressant de voir un autre niveau. Puis, puis de voir ça, est-ce que vraiment la composition en phytoplancton affecte ou si on en voit le même patron? Puis en fait, chaque communauté répond à son environnement qui est structuré à différents, à différents niveaux, donc soit le, son environnement proximal comme le phyto, le zoo plus comme la, le, 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 le lac échelé, puis euh, 
peut-être le jour où le poisson plus son habitat, encore au niveau. Mm -hmm. Pour moi, ça serait vraiment intéressant, mais c'est ça, je pense que. Donc, si jamais ça, le zooplancton répond fortement à ces prédateurs, ben, ça peut être une façon qu'on manque un peu ce couplage, ou qui fait que c'est en tout cas un découplage. Dans, dans cette ligne de pensée, c'est ma dernière question. Oui. Euh, dans quelle mesure tu as fait allusion au fait que quand on travaille avec une approche de vrai fonctionnel, on travaille, on fait un choix, on fait des choix. On fait des choix sur les traits fonctionnels qu'on veut utiliser. Euh, les choix que tu as faits dans le cadre de, 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 de ce travail-là, moi, je, 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 trouvais, je trouvais que ça très bien justifié les choix de très fonctionnel. Considérant ce qu'on vient de discuter sur les poissons et sur la prédation pour les poissons, est-ce que d'autres traits fonctionnels pourraient devenir des, 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 des traits intéressants à regarder par rapport à la pression plus top que vraiment? Ouais, absolument. Système. Je pense qu'on on intègre un peu, on est quand même, je, je serais confiant d'utiliser les mêmes traits pour, euh, parce qu'on avait à la taille, euh, et qui est quand même un trait important, mais il y en a ajouté, puis avec la mine, on a ajouté aussi un trait euh, qui, qui est le. On a dit tout, mais tu sais, un trait qui, qui est comme la, la, la vitesse d'escape de chaque, euh, puis qui n'a pas ressorti en fin de compte comme un trait important. Mais en fait, compte, ça serait vraiment intéressant, comme des traits plus, des traits d'échappement, des, des tout ça. Mais ça, c'est le seul trait qu'on avait. Mais le problème, c'est que ça existe pas. On les a pas ces traits-là. C'est ça qu'on appelle la limitation. Il faut un trait pour chaque espèce. Puis c'est très limitant ce niveau-là. Puis on aime ça. Mais ça, je pense que ça, c'est le trait-là qu'on a mis fait pour la, la, la mine, qu'on a jugé un peu comme en tant qu'expert. Bon, c'est quoi On connaît un peu les limites. On a de 1 à 6, on a capté que c'est quoi les espèces qui sont vraiment lentes à échapper, qui sont vraiment rapides. Ça, je pense que ça serait, la taille et ça serait deux traits cruciaux pour comprendre la réponse aux poissons. Merci. Je n'ai pas d'autres questions. Paul? Euh, là, ça, c'est intéressant, ce euh, truc-là, parce que euh, de la même façon qu'on ne s'attendait pas, à mon côté, on n'attendait pas une cohérence entre non, on pas, à un niveau de, de, de la taxonomie. C'est plus intuitif de penser que peut-être un niveau fonctionnel, euh, il doit être couvert. Ouais. Ah, c'est bon. euh, bon, euh, aussi qu'il y a un même c'est vrai qu'au niveau de taxonomique, on s'avoue une aussi importante. Je pense que trois régions sont vraiment environnementalement ouais. très différentes. Donc, euh, mais c'est pas étonnant dans le sens qu'ils se séparent. Ouais. Mais c'est pas étonnant non plus qu'à niveau fonctionnel, ils ne se séparent pas. Parce non. que pourquoi la vitivie va avoir systématiquement plus de, de filtrations, par exemple, ça ne fait aucun sens. Et l'action intéressante, c'est le lien entre les deux. Ouais. Donc, euh, euh, à niveau fonctionnel. Euh, et ça, c'est pour moi, c'est une question importante. Avais les... Moi, j'avais une, une petite question par rapport à, à une question. Je ne sais pas si c'est même une question, mais dans, dans un des, des, des résultats peut-être les plus frappants, c'est le fait que la diversité fonctionnelle a un effet négatif sur la, sur la biologie. Okay? Donc, ça c'est un peu contre... contre, contre euh, oui. Ah, just realize that maybe because you're in French. <rire> J'ai représenté la partie francophone. Non, 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 mais ça va, c'est non. You have a negative relationship with the uh, in, in that thing, which is um, mathematically correct, because this is what happens, right? But conceptually interesting, uh, because uh, have you found a, a positive relationship with evenness? You, not you, but it could have been interpreted that, oh, well, um, indeed, more, you know, diversity enhances uh, production, which is the paradigm which is always hanging around. No? Now, how, what do you say about this one? Uh, yeah, yeah, because yeah. then, if you have a negative relationship, you could potentially conclude that well, your your, bed, your lake is better off having less diversity, right? And that probably is not the way to, to interpret this. Thing. And I think there's many levels at, at that question. There's many levels of complexity. But you know, like at first when we saw that result, I think I, I was I, I was disappointed because I was in my mind, okay, we need to diversity should be, but. 
after, and we look at Lacroche data to better understand the relationship, and this, to me, the now this relationship makes a lot of sense. And as I was uh, telling Jason earlier, I think with functional evenness here, this relationship just reinforced the idea that it's the identity of species that is important. And when you look at functional evenness, the measure we're using in, Lac in Lacroche, for example, so we know that Zolpoint, oh, I have it here somewhere. Right, zooplankton, the succession in zooplankton is happening really fast, right? So we have like a peak in one species and then peak in another species. And if we superimpose functional evenness, it's, it's here actually. So we have this line, we don't see it very well, but when we have this species that dominate, then functional evenness is really low. But it's in this moment that production is high. So if this species is reproductive at that time, so production is high, functional evenness is low because this species is dominating. Then later in succession, when all the species are mostly equal, then functional evenness is increasing, but still low. But at the end, all, all they're all very equal, and then it's high. So I think functional evenness, it's not really a relationship between diversity. It's just we're, under, we're really tracking where we are in succession and changing stru the, the, the structure. Of so, but that would suggest to me that, um, in fact, um, evenness is not driving anything. In the sense that it's not because of it, uh, what uh, what seems to happen is that you have times sort of, of the year when resources are very high of a particular type of resource that's selected for a particular type of zooplankton that right. is good at consuming that. Right. You that are the times of high total production, and because you only have you have dominance of one zooplankton using that very abundant resource, you have no evenness. But in your structural equation model, even the, the sign of, the, the, of, of that interaction that you have there is even as influencing production in a, in a way. No? So, but, but to me, even this, to me, the, the, the idea is that structure, the way your company structure influences production. And even this, as all the other diversity, this is, is a way to characterize how the structure that community. So this, and then I think it's, it's, there, it's in the right direction. It's just a, your community is structured in a certain way, even as enable you to, to characterize that structure. And then when that's in that structure, it's more productive and more structure is less productive. So I think it's, it's just a way to characterize, but it, at the end, it's community structure matters. And yes, there's probably, as you see the SEM, there's probably, Part of that structure that is explained by, and by environment, but not all of it. There's also other things that affect structure, and it's but just that this structure, but it's hard to characterize. Yeah. Right. This, this, we might take on that. But uh, the flip side of that is, had there been a positive relationship with yeah. diversity, uh, we would have interpreted it very differently. Yeah. We would have said now it's not just it's an index of structure. We would have perhaps uh, interpreted it as well. That higher diversity leads to more. Uh, uh, yep. So it, it's a it, it's an interesting game of interpretation, not this uh, this thing. But to me, even even if it was a positive, it's, it's again it's, it's the same thing. It's a measure of structure. So it's just a different kind. But you're right. This is something that okay. We when you go in the literature, okay, now it's positive, now it's negative, now there's nothing, and it's it's going all over the place. But I think we we, we need to be honest about it and and touching to. For on your first question about should we say that more diversity is 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 is, uh, is worse? I think we really need to put into context what we did here, and we measure instantaneous production. So it's just saying that on a very short time scale, production is higher when one species is dominant, and that makes sense. But it doesn't mean that, and I think that over a season, when if you measure production over a season, diversity over that season must be important. And, Maybe that if you have more diversity, it enables to have more of these peaks of production per species. I don't think that having only one species in a lake, annual production would be higher than with many species. I think it's just the scale we're working on. I think this is something that, that we really need to understand and not get the wrong message that less diversity is equal more production. No, but the, the reason I, I, it's not because necessarily of your work, but in no. general, the, you, know, you, you showed us at the beginning of your, of your talk that the, the bar graphs with the positive, negative, neutral results that people get in the literature and so on. And um, of course, everybody wants to interpret what they what they get, no? but the interpretations can be so, so, so different. Yeah. 
depending on what the context uh, of the studies are. And I think this is a good example. And, but, and, and, and I think something related to what you said I, I mentioned earlier, I think, and it's, it's, it's sad because maybe it's always like that, but it's always dangerous when we say diverse ecosystems are always more productive, right? There's always more complexity to that. And to generalize, I think it's always dangerous. And, it, and there's, it, it brings the other reaction that people like, they test it, doesn't work, and it doesn't work. And then people are saying, okay, but, okay, but this idea of biodiversity and custom functioning should be not study because look, it's just, we need to go and to look at, at, at systems, see all our differences, different organisms. And there's, and we, I think we need, and I think the framework we develop, and this is something I'm very proud, could, Enable us to really uh, objectively assess this importance, but you're right. It's you always interpret and, and depending on what you're finding. Okay. Uh, well, the lesson learned question. <laughs> so, but I want you to put it in a future context. Yeah. So, um, you know, we have this project Lake Falls. We're going to mm -hmm. sample 600 lakes, 680 lakes across Canada. Uh, in the scientific committee right now, we're talking about methods and what we're going to sample, and one of the big controversial issues is uh, should we take cores for paleontology, mm -hmm. um, as well as the, the open water samples. So they're intensive, they take a lot of time. And kind of a, what would your argument be? Hmm. That is, that is. Based on what you've learned. You think it, yeah, so if, if you, about the cores. Yeah, should we yeah. be taking paleo, should we invest in that? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I. Yeah, to me, I, I would say yes for sure. Like cores. Why? Give me why? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> the, I, I guess it's always depending on your question, right? Mm -hmm. And but you know that if you want to track all those, and we know that, and like in, even in the lakes, and this is something that I, I learned uh, working up north on the mine. We always had the impression that we're working on pristine lakes, even the reference lakes. But all lakes have already changed. Like it, it, we are just in that, that pathway towards more disturbance and everything. And I think it's always interesting to understand what happened before. And because lake community structure is not only changing in time, but it's in changing also on, the, on, on that larger scale. And I think it's always interesting to see how those structures change. And maybe that uh, with models that like, like, like the one we developed, we can back, back calculate how this productivity changed and everything, and I think the historical aspect, and we didn't, we didn't add it, but I think we have we have some cores for the for the, the thing. But I always I think it's always interesting to, to go there, and maybe I don't know that not all the species are there, and maybe go functional also at that, at that level, and see just maybe go at the core level, and even it, and this is also something that we talk with the mind, functional approach going at the when there is limited resources could be a good way to. To really go at the course or level and uh, get interpretation. So, of course, I would say I like, use the, the, the course because it's in that. I think in the question that the lay pulse is asking is so interesting to see what happened and where to, to, uh, to better understand where we are going. And yeah, to. Would it have solved some of your problems? Oh, I guess. Uh, yeah, probably. Probably. Or some of the shortcomings? Yeah, I think so. And, yeah. I, of course, and also like maybe more. I think it would, for us it would be even more relevant maybe sediment traps to understand at a shorter time scale what happened, right? And you're right that maybe maybe it's, yeah, that's a really good suggestion that maybe instead of saying okay we're gonna go ten times to that lake in the summer, set a sediment trap and just like see okay in the past month what happened with the community yeah, that it's a really good maybe it would have helped to understand uh, maybe not. On the annual scale, like what happened five years ago, but on a short time scale, yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. Ça va? Merci. Merci. Il n'y a pas d'autres questions? Ok. On va vous demander de maintenant euh, prendre ma place, adresser des questions, débattre avec le, le candidat pendant que nous allons aller les Et nous revenons dans quelques minutes. Yeah, Rich. Did you mention the, 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 the
load with the reference loads and whatnot. Did you look at all the time series just as they were? It looks kind of synchrony analysis. Um, among the all the lakes and the, the reference lakes. No, no, we didn't. Uh, and you would you think to to see what to see patterns that as they were saying like things are happening at a larger scale or a yeah. longer time scale. No, we didn't. Uh, the only thing that we noticed, and this is why what I mentioned, is that even in the reference lake, phytoplankton community are slowly changing. And this is something we know, and just, and it's not a, an oscillation or anything, it's just they are getting enriched in, in nitrate also, and they are changing. But we didn't, uh, no. And, yeah, yeah. If you look at the correlation to the time series, you can see the potential for coordinating events. Mm. So if you look at the pre my period, and you have a section where they're starting to converge, you can see if that corresponds to an LDO signal or something like that. Oh. And then if you take out, let's say, the first year post mine, see if that was a coordinating event in terms of driving their common responses. The oh, that's a good point. That's a really good kind of detrend for that, right? Yeah. Oh, that's a really good idea. We can do that. I've got it all set up. Yeah, that would be great. It's too bad that paper is already published, but, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very good idea. Yeah. <laughs> but that would be super interesting. But is it, it 20, 20 years enough to then? Yeah. I did it with 15 and it worked right. Nice. That would be great. Why is it? I'd like to hear you talk more about the taxonomy of the straight approach. <laughs> on the on the Je trouve ça bizarre soit toi qui pose cette question. Ça m'intéresse pas vraiment, je pense. Other questions? Oui. J'ai euh, ai beaucoup aimé ton talk, Nico. Félicitations. Euh, quelque chose que je trouve vraiment intéressant, peut-être que tu n'as pas trop parlé sur ça, c'est la question des replacement des species en question, dans les questions fonctionnelles. Donc, tu peux avoir deux espèces qui vont avoir la même fonction. Mais pourtant, dans une communauté, taxonomiquement, chacune des espèces est vraiment indépendante et on les considère de façon indépendante. Donc, déjà, quand tu penses, à la base, il y a quand même, euh, de, de, du départ, il y a, déjà, il y a une, une question un peu conceptuelle qui est problématique parce que dans le fonctionnel, en fait, ce qui est vraiment intéressant, je trouve, dans le fonctionnel, donc peut-être que moi, j'irai plus pour le fonctionnel que pour le taxonomique, peut-être. Je me pencherai plus sur le... C'est pour ça que j'ai vraiment beaucoup aimé. Euh, C'est que, en fait, il y a cette question de replacement, en fait, donc si tu as une espèce qui est très diverse, mais par exemple, il y a eu un impact anthropogénique qui est quand même très important, et tu perds quelques espèces, peut-être que ce n'est pas aussi grave, parce qu'il y a des autres espèces qui peuvent accomplir ces mêmes tâches à niveau fonctionnel. Donc, qu'est-ce que tu en penses de ça mais, Je pense que l'idée, c'est comme je le disais, ça, c'est vraiment l'idéal. Mais le problème, là c'est toujours de bien caractériser tes traits fonctionnels. Parce que tu peux manquer quelque chose aussi, c'est sûr. Parce que tu peux dire, tu peux dire, tu sais, est-ce que, es est que les espèces sont est des espèces qui sont exactement les mêmes fonctionnellement? Non. Donc, tout, ils vont toujours avoir une différence à certains niveaux. Tu sais. C'est juste de dire, mais moi, c'est les traits qui sont importants pour moi. Puis de rester ouvert à ce que tu peux peut-être manquer. Des fois, tu, tu groupes des choses de ne pas les couper. Mm -hmm. Et c'est sûr que dans un idéal, dans un, si dans un monde idéal où tu mesures les bons traits et que tu fais vraiment les traits importants de la réponse sur l'effet de l'ancienneté, puis dans la tête, on est mieux que moi pour répondre à cette question-là. Mais. <rire> Je pense que dans un idéal, oui, c'est une approche pour comprendre l'effet, tu sais, pour comprendre l'effet d'une activité minière. C'est comme quand on l'a fait pour la mine, on était tellement content parce que tu voyais, ok, ben, je perds telle espèce de phytoplancton, aux autres, ça leur disait rien, mais là, on vu qu'il y avait un gros effet sur l'édibilité du phytoplancton parce qu'il y avait des grosses espèces avant. Puis maintenant, c'est des petites espèces qui sont très facilement consommables par le phytoplancton. On n'a pas eu d'effet sur le phytoplancton, sur la biomasse, mais avec les autres, ça va permettre de mieux comprendre aussi, de dire, ok, ben, c'est ça le changement qui arrive au lieu de dire, ben, j'ai pris cette espèce-là, cette espèce-là. Ça ne leur parle pas vraiment beaucoup, non plus. même pour nous. Tu sais, c'est comme ça nous parle plus aussi. Je parlais de discours, j'ai plutôt un mot interprétation puis généralisation. C'est très puissant comme méthode. Mais il y a toujours des trucs pour bien qu'on fasse attention. Quel trait qu'on choisit, comment on les approche. Puis, euh... Ça avait signé quelque chose pour moi aussi. Euh, basically boils down to herbivores and aquatic systems aren't the best. Right? They're not picky. They're not picky, right? But part of that, that just function of the relative 
range, it's still geometry. We're going to see in what the planet compositions are going to be between the systems because they have to be picky in the first place. They need to be picky. You're, you're, you're totally right. Like, there's probably a big impact of the commission, and you know, like, phytoplankton is one of the better resources that is out there. Like, it's, it's just good quality resources yeah. with, without defense. Like, they're, they're just there to consume in large abundance. So, of course, there's, there's those differences between the two systems that may change completely what mechanisms are important. And I also think, and this is, I didn't cover it, but also another thing that's super important, I think, is that temporal scale because like you know like when we look at plankton it's happening like succession is happening like that right and then when you look at terrestrial ecosystem it's happening over centuries right so the, the scales are completely different so probably it makes sense we're comparing different things I think so and both may explain and that. I think it gets back to perhaps that's why functional traits are more relevant to aquatic systems relative to terrestrial systems yeah. maybe taxonomy does still matter here right no, no, I think that's a good point maybe maybe you're right what about along those lines of the idea of niche permanence? So complementary more likely more likely a spot where your plant you can't move. So you have to partition your spot in the environment more mm -hmm. deliberately than a species, which is subject to turbulence. Yeah, that's and a good point. Can move as well. So I think yeah. the specific uh, person mechanism. The movement is also completely different. Because yeah, yeah. you got these understory plant species, you got the canopy plant species. Kind of, they have a little bit of that about plant, but not the same. No. This is why morphology is probably influencing the soup plants because you are going to have that sort of niche, the greater niche parts of shit. Right? Probably, yeah, it's something like, something is that, that is known, right? That, that, that is an effect of how big is your ecosystem on, on the, the diverse. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I think it depends at which level. I think for zooplankton ecology, I think the model we developed for measuring zo I think maybe part of the metal, model we developed for measuring production, zooplankton production at a large scale. And it, really, like, it, it is something that was really missing because there's a very good understanding of, of what drives the phytoplankton production. There's now a good understanding of what drives the fish production at that scale. But zooplankton was really the missing part. And we're talking about production at the ecosystem level, and, and we're talking more thinking about ecosystem, and that component was really missing. And I think something, this is something that, having that model saying, okay, this, these are the variables important to drive zooplankton production at that level are important. Uh, I would say to, from an ecological perspective, uh, I think the approach, more than the results, I would say, that, that, we, that we use to see the effect of environment and function in natural ecosystem using the SEM and being able to really understand the links between environment, the complex things between environment structure and, and, and uh, function, I think the framework there is really interesting. And the results also, and see these differences and the importance of the identity, but I really like the framework that we used and now we were able to answer that question. Hey, Jeff. So related to that, uh, you mentioned the approach and the stats and all. So what do you think you know now? We did not know before you went to 100 days. It's really similar questions, but in a different setting. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we think about production, I think like the fact that production is, I think we, we thought that production was regulated really like on a different scale for zooplankton. So responding to temperature, uh, to, to the food concentration, change in community structure, like in size. But now we, we really get the feeling that, like, like the morphometry thing, like it's regulated another level, right? It's, and it, it's, it's really the first, it's comme la première fois qu'on est face. So it's really the first step of it, of really understanding it. But the fact that there's the, all these scale matter, it's, I think it's a lot more complex than we thought before. And it's more complex than what was found for a phytoplankton, but it makes sense. Makes sense. So all these different skills for me is really something that, that we add in this understanding. So we it's to, so we're saying it's more complex, but at the same time, this to me this complexity is interesting and in really understanding what is the influence of catchment characteristic on, on, on that production. I think that that's interesting. As for the rest, I think it 
for me, at least, the thing with the interaction was, was really interesting, but looking at zooplankton, phytoplankton on the landscape, and really trying to ask the question, what, and what is that, that importance of trophic interaction? And also in the, in the context of an important anthropogenic activity, I think this was something also a big, uh, very important contribution. So? <laughs> now it's cruel. Now it's cruel. <laughs> Huh? Ah, c'était le fun. C'était le fun, j'ai un bon moment. C'est vrai que le, le début des questions, c'est vraiment ça, ça c'est vraiment difficile. Comme les quelques premières, le temps de comme prendre ta vitesse. That was hard. C'est tout en dire ça que je parlais avec Jeff aussi de la semaine. Ça, ça commence par l'externe. Ça, c'est comme, tu sais, je fais ces commentaires, je sais sur quoi il n'est pas d'accord. Mais ça, c'est plus, plus difficile. La première question, c'est que j'ai Je savais que c'était ça. Mais non, ça, la transition entre les deux est vraiment difficile, je trouve. Je ne m'attendais pas à ce soit si dur que ça. Mais... Comme tu es en mode présentation, après ça, comme. Hein? C'est pas juste des questions, c'est plus comme une. Tu comme, OK, il faut que tu repenses. On dirait que ton minding d'esprit doit complètement changer. T'sais. Mais non, c'était cool, c'était plaisant. Had a great time. Yeah. Now it hopefully yeah. was the last one. Thanks. Oh yeah. Now I can put the slide with the remerciement. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> intéressant les questions, c'est tout en dessous. Ben, ça fait partie de la game, c'est comme... Non, mais c'est pas Non. Oh, <laughs> 
Après avoir évalué votre thèse, assisté à la soutenance que vous en avez fait et délibéré euh, entre eux, les membres du jury recommandent que l'université accepte votre thèse comme satisfaisant de l'exigence du doctorat en biologie et qu'elle vous accorde de, 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 de grade de PhD en sciences. Euh, je tiens premièrement à exprimer au nom du comité notre appréciation de cette soutenance, particulièrement à la période de questions où vous avez été, euh, comment dire, aiguisé, rapide et ouvert d'esprit aussi dans les commentaires que le comité vous a adressés. On... Cela a fait pencher le comité pour vous donner la mention d'excellence. Donc, on vous félicite sincèrement. Alors, je vais remercier les mêmes de, de membres du jury. Je félicite à M. Nicolas Fortin et Joël. Et euh, maintenant, je vous invite de rentrer. Euh, merci. Ah oui, je vais le remercier. Hey, <rire> ben, je remercie, madame, évidemment, tout le monde, euh, tout le monde qui était ici, qui sont venus aujourd'hui me supporter. C'est d'avoir les gens qui, qui sont importants pour nous le, autour, autour, du, tout, tout autour du processus. C'est vraiment. C'est vraiment important, tous ces gens-là avec moi. Puis, bon, tous les gens qui ont été devant le comité, les équipes de terre, le terrain, ça a été vraiment une partie importante aussi au labo. Euh, je pense que Catherine, Marilyn, qui ont aidé beaucoup plus avec, avec moi, euh, Jean-François, Justine, qui ont fait, on a fait beaucoup de terrain ensemble trois années. Euh, puis aussi, tous les gens, les discussions scientifiques, autant au niveau de, dans le laboratoire à Béatrix, avec Alexandre, avec Sidney, euh, que dans le labo à Paul. J'ai été vraiment choyé euh, d'être aussi bien euh, entouré euh, à l'UQAM et tout ça. Puis, euh, pour le futur, puis merci aussi à Elise qui m'a supporté dans, dans toutes, toutes ces nombreuses années-là quand même. Fait que c'est ça. Puis merci surtout, c'est vrai aussi, je ne veux pas oublier, mais à vie puis à Paul, vraiment, ça a été euh, vraiment une expérience incroyable. Ça a été, puis tu sais, c'est drôle parce que Bertie t'en parlait tantôt, puis j'avais exactement la même pensée hier. J'avais cette image encore quand on se rencontrait dans le bureau à McGill. J'étais au bac, j'étais en sabbatique à McGill dans ce temps-là, puis je pense que je ne m'attendais pas à ce qu'elle allait être l'expérience que j'avais vue après ça, mais c'est la plus belle décision de ma vie d'avoir accepté là, de, de faire ce projet-là. J'avais vraiment cette image-là, puis c'est vraiment drôle, puis c'est là que tout est parti. Puis, fait que, merci beaucoup à vous deux, ça a été vraiment, vraiment magnifique. Merci. Euh, 
Pour la petite réception après, euh, dans, la, dans la salle de grille, je pense que vous êtes tous au courant. Maintenant. Maintenant, là. Vous pouvez rester. Vous pouvez rester.